morning and welcome. I hope you all can hear me all right. Can you hear me in the back? That's good. Okay, well, welcome to the uh, East Hampton Healthcare Foundation Annual Symposium. Uh, I am Henry Murray, Chairman of the Board of the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation. Today, the uh, title of our, our topic is The Future of Healthcare. We've got quite a program for you. So right now, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for today, who spent a lot of time working on this, Linda James, who is now passing out water. OK. Multitasking. <clears throat> Multitasking. Always something that anyone involved with with health care. Everybody hear me? Otherwise, I'll shout like I do at my children. No, you don't want me to do that. So anyway, we all have to learn how to multitask. And in a sense, that's almost about underlies a lot of what we're going to be saying. Good morning now, I can say it for real. Thank you for giving your time this morning to join the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation and Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, their educational symposium. Thank you to the library and to the library's staff for making this venue available. The East Hampton Library is a unique community resource in providing platforms for educational events, like today's opportunity to examine the future of healthcare at a time when a better understanding of a changing healthcare arena is so critical to each one of us. In your program, you have information on the four speakers' credentials. Bob Chalner begins by setting the context for the symposium. The future, the future of East Hampton Healthcare. The next speakers will address their medical specialty and the delivery of services in our community. Please hold your questions for the panel discussion following the last speaker. But now that I have said this, here comes the change. And change is also very endemic to our healthcare system. The change is Dr. Skulpecki is on call, of course. He's a doctor. But he will uh, generously, but quickly, address any questions that you have after his presentation. And then he will be on his way. Again, thank you for your interest in better understanding what we have and what we can expect in the future. Bob, let's begin now with your comments on the evolving healthcare system on Long Island's South Fork. Watch my coffee. East Hampton Healthcare Foundation for not only hosting this event today, um, but for the great work that you've done in our community. Without your help, uh, East Hampton would be a very, very desperate place in terms of uh, healthcare capability. Um, their efforts to, to recruit, to create facilities, and to ensure that healthcare resources here in the community have been vital for, for many, many years. And we thank them and appreciate all the great work that they're doing. Um, I also would like to give a shout out to the medical staff in East Hampton. And I see Gail Schoenfeld here. Um, and I see a couple other people we were honoring several last night, Ralph Gibson, George Dempsey. Um, the doctors in East Hampton have struggled. This is a somewhat isolated community from a, uh, from a medical perspective. And the doctors have had to really do it all um, to serve this community well and have done it with grace and skill 
and a passion that you don't see very often in healthcare these days. So I'd like to give a big round of applause, if we could, to the medical staff that have served this community for so long. I'd also like to thank Dr. Skopicki. Uh, you should be thanking Dr. Skopicki because they asked me to do this address and I said how long and Linda and, and uh, Sheila Rogers said, oh, Bob, about six hours. And then we learned that Dr. Skopicki's on call, so I've shortened my remarks for all of you. Um, today's topic is the future of healthcare for, for our communities here in the South Fork. And I'll be addressing broader than, than East Hampton because our, our hospital and the delivery system we have serves from really West Hampton out to Montauk. And now with Stony Brook, um, we're serving the entire, entire East End in, in Suffolk County. Um, and I, as I started thinking about the future, I had to take a little bit of a trip down um, memory lane and think about uh, where we've been as an organization uh, for, for the last decade. And I was remembering, I joined the hospital, it'll be 12 years at the end of this year, um, and I remember uh, my first summer out here in 2007 and um, I was very excited. I had not ever really spent any time in the Hamptons, and suddenly I found myself the CEO of a hospital in one of uh, America's premier resort communities, and I thought, how lucky am I, and how bright is, is the future? Um, and that summer was an interesting experience, because most of that summer, I spent being yelled at by people in the community about um, how far the hospital had fallen, the challenges of, of healthcare out here, the lack of services, um, uh, the fact that some communities, and I remember my first meeting with Henry Murray and Sheila Rogers, um, and the anger, frankly, in East Hampton about the fact that East Hampton felt abandoned by, uh, by the hospital, um, and, the, and the fact that we weren't, we weren't providing many, many resources. Um, I remember going to the gym in Sag Harbor. I proudly wore a Southampton t-shirt and spent about half an hour um, being screamed at by somebody in the gym and please and asked him to bring it to my office. Um, and, and the following summer I spent um, uh, continuing trying to learn about the challenges of, of healthcare out here. And I remember one very, very apocryphal story where, how many of you have heard of Stephen Gaines, the author Stephen Gaines, a big person out here. Um, Stephen's written the, the, the Philistines at the Hedgerow. And um, the first summer, the next summer, um, uh, a TV show was released, The Royal Pain. Show of hands, how many people have heard of The Royal Pains? And I thought, oh great, they're making a TV show about the healthcare in the Hamptons. And um, the first episode, they talked about the only hospital in the ha Hamptons, they called it a taco stand in El Funaria. And um, I really wanted to hide under a rock. I thought, this is, uh, what did I do with my life by, by moving out here? Um, and Stephen invited me to, um, to be on a talk radio show that he had with WPPB at that time, live radio, and he said, Bob, he was very upset about this, uh, about this show, The Royal Pains, um, because he felt that the reality of what was happening in the hospital was very different than, than the way they were describing it. And he said, I want you to come on to the TV sh or onto the radio show, and I want you to, uh, to talk about uh, reality and, 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 and uh, disabuse everyone of what the TV show is talking about. I said, uh, Stephen, it's a TV show. It's fiction. I'm really not going to get into a, a, a shouting contest with a, with a TV show. Um, he said, well, come on to the radio show anyway. You're new out here. We'd like to hear... Um, hear from you and learn about what your plans are. And that was one of my first opportunities to talk about the plans and the future of the next decade of healthcare in the Hamptons. And um, I said, okay, that sounds, that sounds reasonable, Stephen, I'll do that. So um, we went, we met live radio, he put the microphone in front of me and like any good radio person, his first question out of his mouth was, so Bob, what do you think about the Royal Pains? Um, <clears throat> And in one of the few moments of on-the-spot lucidity I think I've ever had in my life, I said to him, Stephen, um, you've watched the show, right? And he said, yes, I have. I said, in the show, the administrator is a beautiful 30-something-year-old woman, and you're looking at a balding middle-aged man as the real administrator, so you tell me how real that tele or radio, television show is. And he said, good point, and we moved on. 
and had an opportunity to talk then about where we were going with the hospital. I bring all of that up um, because um, for the last decade or so, um, we've gone through several phases in healthcare, I think, out here, and we're about to enter a new phase for healthcare, and I'll talk about some of the things that, that we're up to. Um, but for the last decade, early on, it was really about survival. Um, we were struggling. The hospital was near bankrupt. Our facilities were, were falling apart and crumbling. We were understaffed, and we were um, in a fight for our lives as an organization. And the hospital had, in fact, hunkered down. Very little was going on with the hospital out into the, into the broader communities. Um, and very little contact was being made, quite frankly, with the community. Um, and it was all, all about survival. Um, and many people were beginning to write the obituary of the Southampton Hospital and, and, and where healthcare was going. And our doctors were, were, were struggling mightily against uh, you know, all odds. Many of them were, frankly, giving up, cashing in their property and, and leaving. And we were seeing a medical staff shrinking. Um, you know, almost 12 years later, I'm glad that we're, we have a very different reality. A lot of people have pulled together to create um, the present. Um, we have a facility that's, that's um, rejuvenated. We have new programs. We have modern technology. We have a growing medical staff. We've extended our primary care. We've got almost 30 locations stretching from West Hampton to Montauk and a commitment to really get out into the community and serve you better, um, and we are trying to, to, to serve you better. And I think, and we've had eight years of solid financial uh, bottom line every year and a very, very healthy balance sheet at this point. And we are positioned far different than we were a decade ago, and we have the opportunity to really now move into a future that's not about survival, but it's really about learning what you need and serving those needs better than, we, than we've ever been able to in the past. Um, and that's where we are today as an organization. We are at a point where we are eager to learn your needs, and we're eager to learn the needs of all of our communities. And one of the things that's very challenging about serving out here I came from New York City. In New York City, there's a lot of hospitals, and nobody really views any one hospital as the, as the provider of health care for New York City. Some people talk about New York Cornell. Some people are talking about Mount Sinai, um, any one of the hospitals out there. And that's true in any of the large urban environments. And many of you have migrated out here from New York City. Um, and that's been, been your experience. Out here, we're, we're it. And so there's an awful lot of pressure on us as a health system to try and do it all. Um, and do it all means not only in terms of the health resources that we provide, but also, quite frankly, in terms of the communities we serve. And they're very, very diverse communities. When you think about um, um, the, the, the wealthy summer population, which everybody knows the summer, the Hamptons for that, and that's a very, very small part of, uh, of the, the communities. The geographic um, disparity or uh, differences among all of our communities and the differences Montauk's needs versus Southampton Village just from a geographical perspective and quite frankly some of the newer communities like the the, the, the rapidly growing Latino community which has a very different set of uh, health care needs and concerns um, than others um, and so there are many communities and many needs so it's not a simple one solution's going to do it all. We have a real challenge to really understand all of the communities that, that we serve and then really try and put together a plan that makes sense for the, for the broader community. And that's what we're about now. So a couple of things that we're working on, and I'll talk about where I think the future may be going in healthcare here, and then I'll hand it over to, uh, to the doctors who really know what they're doing. Um, we have... Um, a couple of things that, that, that are underway. First of all, many of you have heard about the fact that the hospital is engaged in an effort to try and develop some new facilities that we've recognized as an organization that our facility is a beautiful little campus at this point. We're well maintained, and, uh, but we've outgrown it. The hospital is um, a very, the healthcare needs are very different than they were when that facility was built. The earliest building on the campus was 1930. It was built in a day when people stayed in hospitals for very, very long periods of time. And the, the biggest example we have is, and, and people don't do that anymore, so the, the inpatient needs have shrunk dramatically from what they were 
a number of years ago. And the, the biggest example of that, when you used to get a cataract out, when I started my career, people would get a cataract uh, removed and then they would be sandbagged and lie in bed for two weeks in a hospital after they had that cataract surgery. Um, David Payton, who's on the board here, would, would uh, back me up on that. Uh, now you go in, you have the cataract removed, and you walk out about 15 minutes after you've had the, the removal. Um, so it sounds like there's not so much of a need for hospitals anymore. We don't need the beds. Well, the reality is that while it used to be a lot of time in a bed, we only did so many cataracts. We probably do 10 times as many cataracts today as we did uh, 20, 30 years ago, um, and yet our facility is built for that inpatient capability, and we're trying to run people through old converted inpatient beds and use them as ambulatory care facilities, um, and it's just not working. And so much of what we do at the hospital now is become ambulatory and uh, related to the technology that we're using that the facility is just not meeting those, those needs anymore. Um, and uh, the, the, the story that my engineering folks like to put out, since we've been there the last decade, we've added 375 parking spots in, in various areas around the hospital. You still can't find parking, and it's because that, that ambulatory outpatient side of what we do just, just keeps growing, um, and it, it, that's where, where all the growth is. So we have a facility built for a different era, and we need to, we need to do something different. So the board has made a decision that we need to, we need to build a new facility that's better suited for the needs of the community. And we also need to look at the other geographic communities we have because we don't believe that positioning all of our resources in one physical location is the right way to do it anymore. You all know about the travel, traffic uh, problems. I live in Northwest Woods, which people keep referring to me as the Adirondacks of East Hampton. And, um, and it feels that way, trying to travel anywhere, but I know what it's like trying to get back and forth to the hospital from uh, Northwest Woods, particularly in the summer. Um, and my heart really goes out to the folks out in, uh, in, in Montauk. Um, so the idea of distributing resources has become a very important part of, of what we think about. <clears throat> so we've, we've engaged in this, uh, we've committed to the fact that we need to get new, uh, modern facilities and we need to get facilities that are, are better suited and, and better located for the needs of, of our communities. Um, we don't want to just rebuild what we have and that's really where we're at right now as we started to look at the opportunity to plan and think about the future we said um, you know it would be a mistake to just rebuild Southampton Hospital because we don't know um, we know that the old Southampton Hospital doesn't work, and we really ought to try and look into the future 10 years or so, as, as good a crystal ball as we can find, and see what type of facilities we ought to build. Maybe, maybe it's a very, very tiny inpatient facility and much broader ambulatory. Um, we don't know exactly, and that's where we are today, is to re we've really engaged in, a, in an intensive fact-finding strategic planning effort um, to understand the needs, to try and understand what's happening both nationally, regionally, and locally in terms of healthcare, and try and make some predictions so that we can start to size the facilities appropriately and design and program the facilities appropriately before we put any shovels in the ground. Um, and a lot of, some of you may have already been engaged, we've started some of that um, outreach and consumer surveying. Um, and some of you may have already received some of those calls from the folks that we're using to collect that data, um, but an effort to really understand. And we don't want to get too far down the road right now about people keep asking me, what's the hospital going to look like? You know, some people want to know the color of the walls already and the landscaping around the outside. And the, the proper response is we don't know yet. We need to, we really need to research that and we need to be smart about how we move forward. I'm absolutely convinced that we will move forward and we'll be launching a massive uh, fundraising and planning effort over, over the coming uh, year, um, but the first step is to really do this planning correctly. Um, we have learned a couple of things, and that's where, where I wanna go before I hand it over to the, to the doctors. We've learned a couple things that um, about the market that I think are interesting, that are trends that we're seeing and that I think are gonna affect healthcare. And a um, couple of those things 
um, are important for our planning. I think they're also important um, from your perspective as, as healthcare consumers. Um, number one, our community is growing. So the capacity that we have today, we are likely to outstrip in the coming years. Um, and it's growing in interesting ways. I just saw some statistics about the, the school age population here. And the school age population in East Hampton has been pretty flat. But the mix in that school age population has grown pretty dramatically. Uh, the Latino community is just burgeoning out here in, this, uh, in, in, in East Hampton and other parts of our area. And that community and its growth are bringing a new, unique sort of set of, uh, of health care challenges for us. Uh, one in terms of insurance, in terms of access, even some of the, uh, the, the, the medical issues. Um, certainly they create needs for translation services and, and new services. So there's growth in certain communities and there's an overall growth also, 2% or so a year. Um, out here in the Hamptons, um, but where the growth also is, is in the older population. Um, and we're seeing it, you know, two factors. Number one, the baby boomers are, are aging out. Um, and also, many, many more people are discovering, hey, this is a nice, nice place to retire, as I'm sure many of you had, and they're spending more time here. We're also seeing the growth of the people who, even if they don't declare this as their year-round residence, are here, um, uh, more and more during the year, and I think you all know that. It used to be Tumbleweed Tuesday, that was the end of the season. It's busy right through the weekends up to Thanksgiving at this point. This year, um, our ER, Dr. Wiggins will speak, and our hospital were extremely busy starting in March. The season really started several months earlier. So we're seeing this, this organic growth throughout the community, um, and we know that that's something we need to anticipate. Um, we also know that the community, as I said, is aging. And aging brings um, a whole host of challenges. Um, most healthcare uh, utilization is, is in older people, people 60, 70 years or older, and you all know that. Um, and um, those are creating new and more intense needs for the services that, that we are providing. And all the diseases that, that come with, with aging. And we've already started um, many, many um, programs um, to meet those needs. You're going to hear from Dr. Skopicki and what we're doing in, in cardiac services. Um, people, we were hearing this, people were afraid to live out here as they got older because what happens if I have a heart attack? And we used to think it was a dream, certainly 12 years ago when uh, um, uh, Stephen Gaines was interviewing that, that we'd ever have the capability that we have today, but now we've got a cardiac cath lab. And, since uh, September of last year, our first year of operation, we're up to 320 cardiac cath procedures, including several very dramatic life-saving procedures, people that wouldn't be alive out here because they wouldn't have made it to Stony Brook previously. And Dr. Skopicki will talk about, uh, about what we're doing in that, that entire area. We've created a stroke service, and Dr. Wiggins and the efforts that they have in our emergency room around stroke diagnosis, early diagnosis, stabilization, um, and the ability to treat strokes is another, another condition of aging that we need that, we need that, um, that capability. And also our vascular service, and we have a, a, a brand new endovascular service. Dr. Tassiopoulos and his team from Stony Brook are here, Dr. Cooley is full-time, and they are um, uh, dealing with all the issues around uh, vascular disease that tend to be something that, that we see in an in aging population also. So, and that's something that we need to continue to look at those trends um, and really understand where, um, where the needs are for an aging population, because we do ex expect that uh, to continue to change. Um, as I said, um, the growth of certain communities and, and the ability to deliver culturally sensitive services and so services that are well um, positioned to serve those communities. The Latino community, and we've been partnering with organizations like Hudson River Healthcare um, to bring care to the underserved communities, and we have a number of them. People are always surprised when I tell them that the uh, poverty rates in the Hamptons are actually quite large and the number of populations that need health care that just don't have access and even the working population that doesn't have access to very good um, uh, insurance out here with all the, the, pro the, the preponderance of small employers, um, there's a real need for, for clinics and, and ambulatory programs where people can get that help. Dr. Schoenfeld and what she's been doing with pediatric population out here 
I forgot the number, Gail. You said last night 45, 50 percent of your pop, 50, 58 is uh, is Medicaid, which is the the insurer of uh, for for poor people, um, for kids. So 58 percent of the kids being treated in her practice in East Hampton. Um, so the need for additional services. Um, for these specific populations, and it cannot be hospital-based because we don't want people using the emergency room. That's the most expensive place to get care. Um, we want folks to really get pr good primary care, like in Gail's office and some of the other facilities that are, that are being built. So in addition to the central facility, we need to make sure we've got these primary care practices. And we've already done a lot of work with our existing medical staff and in recruiting doctors into the community and making sure that we've got the opportunity to, to, to create those. Another need that we're seeing um, are there are specific disease conditions out here um, and a few unique differences in our community than, um, than we see in other places. And, and one of the most striking is the rates of cancer are, are actually fairly high relative to the, to the rest of the state and even other parts of Long Island. Um, and in many, most communities, heart disease tends to be the number one killer. East Hampton, I don't know if it's still the case this year, but for many years, cancer has been the number one killer. Um, and nobody knows exactly why that is. It could be a combination of the people who live here, maybe some environmental factors, maybe just the fact that we're an older population. Um, but there is, a, there is a lot of cancer, and that's another thing that we need to plan for and then plan around are the specific disease conditions that we, we are seeing in this community. And some of the things that we're doing about that, probably um, the, we've had a track record already of working with the Ellen Hermanson Foundation and groups like that um, to develop services around breast cancer and outreach. We're working with our urological group around prostate cancer. Um, and you'll hear from Dr. Ryu in a little bit who is leading our efforts um, to create a cancer center on the South Fork with radiation and, and chemotherapy which will open by the end of this year, and we're extremely uh, pleased and proud of that, a freestanding cancer center. Um, and again, that's a facility, and I talked about, everybody talks about rebuilding the hospital. It's, it's really not, it's rebuilding the health delivery system because we realize that a cancer center, um, one, we don't wanna wait until we move the hospital because the needs are now. And I've literally had people writing me letters and crying because they just don't wanna travel to Riverhead or Comac for the radiation therapy. Um, and um, uh, it needs to be located more centrally uh, for the people we serve. And it also needs to be, um, uh, people tend not to want to get cancer treatment in a hospital. Um, they like to be in a nice, beautiful facility um, that doesn't necessarily feel like a hospital. So that's, that's what we are creating. And Dr. Ryu will be speaking about that in uh, just a moment. Um, so there are, and there are other diseases like that that, that we're looking at. I, I mentioned about some of the diseases of aging. One of the other programs we've been working on is Parkinson's. We've seen a, a growth in Parkinson's disease, and we've launched a whole new Parkinson's effort. And we are, will continue to expand that um, over, the, over the coming years um, and, and place it appropriately, I think, is the most important thing. Another trend that we've, we've seen is uh, consumerism. Um, when I started my career, I remember the first time I talked about, um, I went to a group of our ER nurses, not here, but another hospital, and I talked about we needed uh, customer service. And the, the nurses looked at me and said, what are you talking about? And I said, it's, you know, it's about customer service. People want good customer service. They're not customers, they're patients. Um, and a patient means we know what you need better than you know what you need. And that was the old model of healthcare. In the old days when people would walk into a hospital, hand themselves over, take all their clothes off, give all their history, and basically put your fate in the hands of the nurses and the doctors, and, uh, and, and they, uh, you relied on their technical expertise. And you still do. Um, but you don't want to be treated like a patient anymore. You want to be treated like a customer. Um, and particularly, this is an issue that's probably more for the younger generation coming up. We know that if we don't adopt some of those customer service skills, um, we're going we're gonna to lose those patients because people don't want to be treated like a, 
like uh, patients anymore. They don't want to go to a waiting room and sit in an uncomfortable plastic chair and sit for two hours to see the doctor. They want to book an appointment online. They want to get there. They want to get in and out as, po as quickly as possible. And they want everybody smiling at them the entire step along the way. And ideally, don't bill them for it. Um, but um, uh, that's, um, and we have a long, long way to go in terms of learning from other industries and, and, and looking at where, uh, where change is going in terms of consumerism. And one of the things in our planning has to be around that. Our facilities need to look better. Um, we know that when we build inpatient beds, there's not going to be semi-private rooms anymore. Nobody wants to be. The days when you had to pay a premium to get into a private room um, otherwise, you were in a semi-private with somebody else vomiting uh, behind the sheet next to you are over. People don't want that in their health care anymore. People want beautiful rooms. They want their families to be able to visit um, in the ambulatory facilities. They want living rooms, not waiting rooms. They, wanna, they want to um, book appointments online. They want to get access to their information, and they do want to understand their bills. Um, and we have a long, long way to go to, 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 to deal with a lot of those things. Um, but over the coming years, um, we're absolutely committed to doing that out here and making sure that, you know, 10 years from now, um, we're, not, we're looking back at some of the ridiculous patterns that we used to use, and, and, and hopefully all of those, those things are fixed. So. Um, we're absolutely seeing this rise of consumerism, and we think in order to stay um, vital as a healthcare organization, we're going to have to have to meet that challenge. Um, we see locating services as part of that also, because you just don't want to drive as as consumers, and you know the traffic patterns are are horrific, um, and um, nobody wants to drive. I always have told uh, the folks that I work with. Um, who are a little reluctant about this idea of customer service, that it's particularly worse where we are because many people, this is a beautiful place to live and work and play and be outdoors. The last place you want to be is sitting in our emergency room. Sorry, Dr. Wiggins. Um, but you do want to be, people want to get in and out as quickly as possible. So whereas they may, and I know our turnaround times in our emergency room are probably the best in, the, in Long Island and New York City, and I hear this all the time, um, you know, I see the statistics. I know how quickly we can get somebody in to see Dr. Wiggins or one of his staff members, and I know our waiting room is rarely full anymore, um, and yet it's not good enough. Um, and every once in a while I'm tempted to say, you know, um, I know you had to wait 15 minutes, but try going into the emergency room in Manhattan and see how long you would wait. But the reality is our, the folks we serve don't want any wait because you want to get back outdoors as quickly as possible. You want to be served and you want to be enjoying life out here, and especially if you've been working really hard to get out here on vacation, you do not want to spend any time in our organization. So the challenge on us around consumerism, I think, is, is even, even greater. The other trend we're seeing is, is technology. Um, and you've all heard this, but there are some very, very dramatic changes that are happening in uh, technology. And, and we need to anticipate and, uh, and, and plan for those over the coming years. Um, there's a couple of things that we've, we've done already. So um, we have a new hybrid operating room. The hybrid operating room is one of my uh, engineering folks calls it R2-D2, this piece of equipment that I have trouble understanding. But the ability to, we, that's what we use to do cardiac catheterizations. Um, we can do an a a aortic aneurysm repair. Um, we can go in and do amazing procedures with a little tiny um, incision um, and work from the inside out thanks to this equipment. Um, and that equipment creates unique challenges in terms of space needs and infrastructure needs. Um, and it also has many advantages. It lowers infection rates. It gets um, people out faster. Again, we don't need as much time in, in actual hospital beds. Um, but that's, uh, that's been an amazing addition for us. Our diagnostic equipment has changed very, very rapidly. We had a state-of-the-art PET scanning for cancer um, a year ago um, and other diagnostic equipment, including we've just brought some brand new um, uh, uh, mammography screening equipment out here and x-ray equipment out here in, in East Hampton. Um, and that technology has unique challenges. It has, uh, it's costly, um, it needs, like I said, unique facilities. And we don't think it's going to stop. The stuff that we're seeing on the horizon just keeps improving. You know, genomics and genetic uh, 
um, uh, the ability to, to identify disease is going to put pressure on our um, laboratories in ways we've probably never seen. And, and, in, and, and across the board, we're going to continue to see this technological change. And we need to start to anticipate that in our facilities. Um, all of our facilities need to think about that. It's also certain things that used to happen only in a hospital we can do in different locations. Now, because of the, the technology, we don't need to have x-ray all in one location in one, you know, big place. We can spread it out. We've got x-ray in, in West Hampton, Hampton Bays, the hospital in, in here in, in East Hampton at this point. Um, and the ability to, to, to proliferate that equipment throughout the community, I think, will, will help. Um, but also, again, is something we need to factor into, into our planning. The next trend that we're seeing is the demand for wellness services. Um, and we hear about, uh, in healthcare, the, the buzzword right now is managing population health. And the goal is never let people get sick to begin with. Um, and that's really what people are looking for, um, is this notion of don't just, don't just fix my appendix, but keep me healthy. Um, keep me healthy as I get older, keep me healthy um, you know, as I, as I develop some chronic disease and help me restore some quality of life, um, but provide those other services. And we've learned a lot in healthcare. It's not a, just about medicine or surgery. It's also about the other things that we're doing. Um, wellness services. It's about diet and the good work that the Wellness Foundation is doing out here in our community. We're learning about um, opportunities to around meditation and invoking the relaxation response um, and reducing stress, which is probably as, as, as big a killer as anything else. We're also learning about lifestyle and what it does um, as we see the increase of mental health illnesses and the, the rapid increase in the uh, opioid addiction and, and, and alcohol and substances, which is a tremendous issue for our community. And, and every week you, you read about some unfortunate story. Um, and the need for services to keep people healthy to begin with, and it means not only in terms of the, uh, the, somebody that's a yoga teacher working at the hospital, but it's uh, the entire design of the, of the facilities we have. It's the way that our practitioners are approaching healthcare, and it's the way that we are um, uh, invoking um, uh, or bringing to bear new, new disciplines and services that we may not have thought of um, and, and the need for new types of services. Meeting room spaces, so nobody used to gather much in a big room in a hospital other than the medical students for lectures. The public wants to come to things and learn and, and be taught. Um, and we've done a lot in terms of our wellness foundation or the wellness services at the hospital and we have classes, we have outreach, um, but we have a tremendous need to continue to expand that, and that's another trend we expect to continue. We baby boomers don't think we're ever going to die, and we want to be kept healthy and vigorous for as long, long as possible. Um, and the hospital is being looked at in this community as a, as a primary driver of that, of that service. Um, we also have some unique sort of illness issues out here, uh, the tick-borne disease crisis that we're seeing and the need for education and the need for um, prevention services is something that, that, that we need to be at the forefront of creating, um, creating those services, which is putting some challenges in our planning and thinking about the type of services we offer and also the type of people that we need to, to hire and continue to expand. The next area, I think, is that um, is, our, uh, is what's happening with the medical community, medical and cl clinical community generally. Um, and this is a real challenge and a very, very um, severe challenge for, for this community. Um, I think many of you might have heard about the triple aim in healthcare, managing population health quality and doing it cost effectively. The fourth aim they're talking about is, is managing uh, provider burnout. Um, and that's real. Um, the industry is a very, health industry is a very, very complicated place for, for providers to work. We're throwing computers in front of them that don't really work well. We're throwing increasing amounts of regulation. We're telling them work harder for less money. And then we're saying, and keep smiling along the way. Um, and it's an impossible challenge for many of our, our, our physicians and our nurses. Um, and when you think about who they're treating, and we remind our staff, um, it's very different from a shoe store where you walk in, you're all excited about buying a new set of shoes, and you're, um, 
you're happy to be in the shoe store. Nobody's happy to have their appendix burst and walk into an emergency room. It's just not something you decide to do. So our staff and, and the dedication of our staff just blows my mind. You know, every day are confronted by people in pain, people who are vomiting, people who are coughing and, you know, bodily secretions and um, are trying to do it with skill and dignity and their family members are scared, their family members are, are defensive um, and people are, are angry to be there and in pain and they may be psychologically confused and yet our staff are being challenged to, to do this with ever more grace and, and, and skill and it's hard work. Um, healthcare really, really is hard work and, and I've got the easy job, the clinicians have got the tough one and they're burning out and we're seeing that in healthcare. We've got young doctors who are coming out of medical school with loans of, we've got one who has $550,000 in loans um, and they're coming out with a full mortgage um, out of school um, and they're, they're trying to worry about the mortgage, starting a family, deal with all of these issues in healthcare and many of them just can't hack it. Um, they're, they're staying in the field for a few years and, and moving on. Um, and the days of uh, Marcus Welby are, are over. They just, they just can't do it anymore. Um, they're also coming to a community which is beautiful and they're excited to be here and then they discover they can't afford a home. Um, it's an incredibly expensive place to live. And healthcare salaries are pretty good, but they're not Wall Street. Um, and they are very, very difficult. And so now we're asking 67% uh, of our workforce lives west of the, Ham of the, of the Shinnecock Canal, west of the Shinnecock Canal. Um, we were asking them to get to the hospital um, you know, through the, through the golf outing and it was, people were commuting three hours from Manorville to get to the hospital every morning. Um, and it's a real, real issue for this community, what we are going to do um, to, to attract and, and keep providers here. And the hospital can do so much, but we need help. And that's another area that we are seeing. And we don't think it's going to get any easier. The traffic in the last few years, to me, seems like it's gotten worse. Um, and housing prices haven't gotten any cheaper, so find, helping people find a, a place to live is becoming a challenge. Our doctors can't even afford to live out here anymore, let alone our nurses, our technicians, our nurses' aides, aides forget it. Um, so that's an issue for this community, and it's an issue we need to plan for. We have taken a number of steps in our hospital um, to, to resolve or to help. Um, number one, um, when we were recruiting, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Weinbaum, who's our chief medical officer in the back of the room, um, who's been leading this recruitment effort, and he knows full well how difficult, and I would say, Fred, for every 10 doctors, it takes 10, re uh, inter uh, 10 recruits in order to land one doctor at this point. Nurses, it's probably seven to one. Um, and as soon as they, they pick up a real estate section in the paper, they go, to, they go somewhere else. Um, but so we've discovered that there's a couple things we can do. Number one, we need to train more locally. Um, and so we've created residency programs over the last number of years. And we have residency programs in family medicine, um, uh, internal medicine, um, surgery, um, and uh, neuromuscular medicine. Um, and with Stony Brook Laboratory, we're looking at potentially orthopedics, but in general surgery. Um, we have a general surgery training program um, with the hope that many of these young uh, residents, when they train here, they start to develop some roots, they become attached to the community, and then they, then they will stay. Um, and we look forward to them staying. And we have 30 doctors in our community now that are graduates of our programs that would not be here were it not for these residency programs. And we need to do more of that. Um, we also, and right now we have a program, we have 80, 80 doctors training at our, at our facilities um, in any year at this point. Um, and that's become the, the most potent recruitment tool that, that we have. We also have an opportunity to start to train other healthcare professionals. Um, and that's one of the things we're particularly excited about with Stony Brook and the, the opportunity to utilize that campus. And Stony Brook is seeing that campus as an opportunity to expand their, um, 
uh, training of, of uh, graduate uh, students, masters in occupational therapy, physical therapy. Um, we're starting, they just started this summer and we'll be rotating the students through on um, a physician assistant training program. All of these other technical fields that require multiple years of graduate work um, and again with the hope that they train here, they'll stay here, and there's a there's a, a pretty pretty good pattern around that. Um, and and to date, we've seen we've seen quite a bit of success. We want to continue to do that. That means we need to plan a little bit differently. That means that we need, as we're looking at new facilities, we need to make sure we have the educational space for them. We need to have the educational tools in place for them. We need on call rooms in our in our hospitals where they can stay. And, um, and we need the ability to, um, to bring them together and, and teach them in ways that we never did. We also need to put technologies in place, and Stony Brook is working on uh, telemedicine technologies that we can not only use it for remote diagnosis, but technology that we can use for, for remote training of, of these, uh, these young professionals who are, are coming out here. We need to look at housing options in our planning, and we really need to think about housing options. And a lot of people like to give me ideas, but very few have come up with anything that really works yet. Um, but we do need to look at housing options, either on our own property or elsewhere. Um, and unfortunately, healthcare facilities aren't things that most people want in their backyard. So when we talk about building a healthcare facility somewhere, there's that's a little bit of nimbyism, a little bit more than a little bit of nimbyism. Um, but we, we need to build these facilities, folks, if you want to have these people living in your communities and working and serving you when, when you need them. You don't want uh, your doctor commuting three hours before he operates on you in the morning. We need them nearby, um, and we need these facilities, and we need this capability. And we need the community's help in making these facilities available to us and helping us find it, particularly out here, because we can get people to commute to... Southampton, um, but getting them to go any further than Southampton is a real challenge, and it isn't just about doctor housing. I think everybody's like thinking, oh, it'd be great. Well, yeah, we can rent one or two hospital houses to doctors in the community, but what about their office staffs um, who can't necessarily have a big house? We need some apartments and housing out here that these folks can afford um, because otherwise we can't, we can't keep them, and they won't be here to serve you when, when you need them. So the need for clinicians and the options to support them and the financial support that we need to help them get sp supported is another area that we are looking at and continuing to plan for. We're also looking at the aging of our doctors that we have. And we know we have a whole crew of nurses and doctors that are getting ready to retire. Um, and we're going to have some pretty, pretty big gaps as we start to look at that planning. Um, and that's another area that, that we need uh, very carefully to, to look at and, and plan for. And we know we need more, not fewer clinicians as, uh, as we develop some of these solutions. I talked about access, you know about the facts around access, and um, we see access and the issues around access um, uh, to be solved in a number of ways. Number one, we don't just plan for one facility in any single location. You've heard about us moving the facility to the campus. You know we're working on an effort to try and develop a satellite facility out here in East Hampton. Uh, Dr. Wiggins will talk about that a little bit. We have a lot of work to do. I'm, everybody's excited about that. Um, but there's some major hurdles in all of these efforts. You don't just wave a stick and get a new hospital or a new satellite in East Hampton. We've got huge regulatory burdens. We've got to prove it financially. We've got to raise a lot of money. And we have a lot of work for us. And it's by no means a foregone conclusion that we are going to do any of this. Um, we, have to, we have to really, as a community um, and as an organization, we, see we have to be dedicated to getting these, uh, these new facilities and, and rally around the effort to create these new facilities. Um, but we are, are actively planning these new facilities and, and putting down the, ground, uh, the, the, the foundations to, to, to create these. So part of it's building more facilities scattered uh, throughout the region that we serve. It's tying it all together with information systems so that we can make sure that no matter where you are, and our goal between all of our facilities locally and all of the Stony Brook uh, facilities throughout the region are that you will walk in and your record's available instantly everywhere. Um, and we're pretty close to that. We've done a tremendous amount of work in that area. 
um, but we still have, have quite a bit to do. Um, and we want to give the clinicians, no matter where you are, the ability to access that. And the goal to really drive care as close to home as possible. Because the other thing we're noticing, if it's inconvenient, people don't get care, they postpone care, it usually doesn't go away, you end up in our emergency room and that's the last place where, where you should be getting treated for a condition that could be solved early, early on. So we are um, aggressively looking at how do we distribute facilities, and I believe that in the future you're going to see smaller individual facilities and more widely dispersed facilities, especially in our communities where, where that seems to be what people want, with good linkages through IT for records and um, with um, uh, telemedicine linkages so that you can access more and more locally and also some of that, that technology that I saw. We also believe that um, access is something that we can't do alone. Um, and that was a decision that our board members made uh, a number of years ago. We know that the days of uh, standalone community hospitals came to an end a while ago and that, that we need to be partnered. Um, uh, we can't do everything. Um, locally, we need to partner and we need to continue to grow our relationships with groups, groups like the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation, the Ellen Hermanson Foundation, Fighting Chance for Cancer Services. Um, we need to partner with uh, uh, Hudson River Healthcare and what they're doing in ambulatory care and all of these local providers um, and, and, and utilize their services and start to coordinate their services in a way that we never did before. Mental health is one where we've been doing some really interesting work um, uh, with the uh, Family Service uh, uh, League uh, for mental health. They've got a facility out here. Uh, you've heard about the unfortunate suicides in our adolescent population um, and the need for additional outreach and services and emergency services in the school and the East Hampton school system's done a really, really leadership role in working with us and them and getting these resources coordinated. And we've seen a dramatic decline in some of these emergency situations. Dr. Schoenfeld bringing a, uh, a, uh, a psychiatrist and social worker in, into close coordination with her practice. So it's, it's about partnering and bringing those services together. We also decided that we needed to be partnered with an organization that's bigger with us, and that's part of the change that we've made. Uh, we, just, uh, we just completed our first year in partner, uh, after joining with uh, Stony Brook Medicine. Um, we did that because we just felt we could not do it all ourselves. They've got the technical education, they have an educational resource that we think is vast, um, and we wanted to be uh, partnered uh, with them so that they could help extend all of those resources, use us to extend all of those resources into our communities. And we absolutely believe that in the coming years you're going to see more and more of that. And I'm very happy to, to hand over in a second to Dr. Stapicki and, uh, um, and Ryu and have them talk about what they're already doing to bring those services here. Um, we could not have done that without, without an organization like uh, Stony Brook working with us. We also felt that Stony Brook was the appropriate partner um, for another reason. Um, we believe that healthcare is a local resource, we believe that it ought to be grown locally, and we believe it ought to be preserved locally. Um, and there's many, many organizations that look at the Hamptons and come out here and say, wow, look at that wealthy donor population, let's get out there and let's grab some of those patients and bring them back to our facilities up the island or um, in the city. Um, and um, I, every time I see the bus ads with some New York health system driving by on the highway, I want to run one in the middle of January and say, it's January, we're still here. Um, and um, we are here. This is where we live and, 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 and breathe, and we all live out here. And um, we want a health partner that's committed to our region and committed to keeping health care in our region, not exporting the high pay patients or the wealthy patients and leaving our local system with the things that we need a mix. We can't just treat primary care. We need to do the surgeries. We need to do the cardiac procedures. We need to do the high-end stuff. And we need to treat rich and poor if we're going to survive and grow and strengthen our resources. And so our board felt it was very, very important to work with a local 
uh, health system. And, and Stony Brook's mission, like us, is uh, while we're regional East M, they're Suffolk County, and they already had a significant presence out here. They've already been treating our underserved patients, our Medicaid patients. They've already been treating our neonates. They've already been treating our automobile accidents and our trauma cases. And, and we felt that they are the right partner because we want to continue to grow those resources here, not export them to Nassau County um, or, or, or New York City. And we hope that all of you will think about that also as, as you need your health care needs. We want everybody to be comfortable wherever their provider goes. Um, wherever, with whomever provider you want. But it, it drives me a little crazy when somebody talks about how wonderful New York City is. And I'm like, yeah, New York City is out, two hours away. We need, to build the, we need to build the capability here. And to build that capability, not only do we need fundraising and good buildings, but we need people using our services. And we know we need to win your business. And, and I think we are winning, winning your business and we'll continue, continue to build and win your business. So, in summary, our vision is for a less monolithic single facility and for, I, I like to think of it in our maritime environment out here as like a fishing net of uh, spread over the entire region with facilities that are all tied together and spread from, from the entire East End. And we're also now partnering Eastern Long Island Hospital up in Greenport will be joining us and Stony Brook, and the creation of this delivery system is really what we ought to be about. And I know everybody's fascinated with the idea of the new hospital, a new satellite emergency room, which we are working on and develop. But as you can see, we believe it's so much more than that. It's the creation of a delivery system um, for all of, uh, all of your healthcare needs, and we think that, that we will get there. And just uh, finally, I'd like to say that, you know, go back to where I started was the the little sort of apocryphal, somewhat self-serving story about my interview with Stephen Gaines. And, and I remember thinking um, at the time that uh, this was an impossible challenge because it had been after a summer or two of, of literally people telling me I've ruined my career by coming out here. Um, and, um, and thinking, you know, this is, this is a tough, this is going to be a tough challenge. Um, we have a wonderful team of people that I've been very, very lucky to work with, and that team has grown and expanded. And um, given what we've already done, now with the resources we have and the stabilization that we've achieved and the partner that we now have, I truly believe that this vision of a very unique, very strong, very consumer-focused delivery system is, is, is not a dream, but is, is the reality we will build over the next, uh, next coming years. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Again, I'd like to thank the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation. And uh, please ask any questions on anything I've said. At any time, you can call my office. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob, for sharing your vision, which is such an important part of your leadership role out here on, on the South Fork and on Long Island. I can appreciate everything that you said, and I'm glad that we now have messengers in the audience to take this vision and move forward with it. Now, questions for Bob will come at the end of the panel discussion, but I'm introducing Dr. Skopicki, who will take his question after his presentation. Thank you. So uh, thank you very, very much for the kind invitation to come out here today. Uh, my, uh, I, I grew up on Long Island. I, uh, somewhere around 50 years ago, uh, actually 57 to be exact, uh, uh, my family came out here to Long Island to a little horse town uh, called Dix Hills. And uh, At that time, our house cost $19,000. We couldn't afford the $21,000 house. And uh, I proceeded to have a good time growing up, not only in Suffolk County, but also, I just noticed everybody nodded their head, <laughs> uh, but also uh, coming out to the East End 
very, very frequently. Uh, fishing, uh, vacationing, uh, uh, and uh, with friends uh, over the years. And I can tell you, I have traveled to a lot of great institutions, um, and I have never heard a person give a complete understanding of the healthcare system and of their local community the way Bob just did. That truly was a tour de force. From everything from the, the government on down to the, to the office worker, I think you will have an incredibly bright future ahead of you based on what I just heard and the experience that I've had over the last year with Dr. Challoner. I can also tell you, uh, excuse me, I actually have a secretary that every once in a while you catch her saying, no, 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 double your Lasix. <laughs> but I can also tell you that on the opposite end of that uh, spectrum, you also have an incredible operations person in terms of Dr. Weinbaum. Uh, Fred and I have been working over the last six months really trying to understand not only the needs, but how we're going to deliver services in a way at uh, Southampton Hospital that are indistinguishable from the services that we currently are delivering at Stony Brook. So having said that, <clears throat> I'll start off with a couple of numbers that I think are pretty profound. Uh, number one, medical knowledge doubles every five years. So everything that we knew from time immemorial, in the next five years we will double that knowledge. Scientific knowledge doubles every two years. So every technological advance that you can think of that has happened up until today in two years will double that knowledge. And the way that we're going to be delivering healthcare is riding on the coattails of both of those things. So what I'm gonna try and do over the next just few minutes is really take you from a journey in healthcare on a national level down to a Suffolk County, le uh, to a Long Island level to a Suffolk County level and to an east end of Long Island level. And in that span of time, I hope to cover a little bit of the technological advances, but really drill down to how do we deliver everything uh, within uh, a few minutes of your house. So I've gotten the opportunity to lecture uh, all across the country, and the first thing that I usually have to do is tell everybody where Long Island is. So we usually start off with a map like this, and then I go ahead and I say, we're in New York, at which point they immediately think we're there. And then I go ahead and say, no, 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 that's not us. Then I say, this is Long Island. Uh, Long Island in and of itself, I know that uh, oftentimes Brooklyn and Queens don't like to admit they're a part of us, but together, we actually, uh, excuse me, we exist right here. You guys exist right out here. Together with Brooklyn and Queens, uh, we're about seven and a half million people. If all of us kind of got together, we would be larger than 37 out of the 50 United States. And if you guys want us to secede and form our own country, we would be the 97th largest country in the entire world. Suffolk County itself, about a million and a half people. Nassau County, similar numbers. When we take a look at the different diversity within each of the communities, what we really see is they're not as diverse as you think, that everybody is seeing the kind of influx of immigration that uh, uh, Mr. Challoner was talking about, that everybody is seeing the sicker, the aging, populations, the need to deliver health care to the young, the need to um, uh, focus on a very mobile and technologically advanced uh, a group of people who are demanding more and more of our services. These are just some easy demographics and you can see that about 80% of the population is Caucasian, about 10% is black. Um, and uh, the Hispanic community is now between 10 and 15 percent and the fastest growing all over Long Island. When you go ahead and you take a look at the age, if you're focusing on a single age group on Long Island, you're missing at least 30 percent of the rest of the other uh, people you're going to have to deliver health care to. 
Uh, when we take a look at uh, uh, medium income, we have very, uh, an enormous amount of wealth out on Long Island. But when you take a look at poverty levels, we have an enormous amount of poverty. So we have the, both of the ends, and being able to function in a healthcare delivery system is really, really difficult. When we take a look at all the different things that go into making up healthcare, what we still end up is the same problems that everybody else is dealing with. Death uh, on Long Island is due to heart disease, it's due to cancer, and it, that accounts for two-thirds of all the issues that we see surrounding uh, end-of-life care. Stony Brook, as you know, uh, is up uh, uh, about a half an hour away, 45 minutes away. Uh, uh, I apologize without the traffic. Uh, about 600 beds hospital. We have about 25 full-time cardiologists, but we have a, an enormous extent and network of other cardiologists that work and bring patients there or that seek advice from our institution. Um, our uh, hospital system uh, exists between uh, the two of our hospitals, and you can see that there's a pretty strong network of cardiologists that are out there uh, representing Stony Brook. When we talk about what we're trying to deliver between Southampton Hospital and Stony Brook, it really comes down to one concept, and that really is a center of excellence. What's a center of excellence? A center of excellence is a place that you can go with no matter how acute the problem is or how chronic the problem is and know that there is no better care that you can get anywhere in the country. That the quality of the doctor, the quality of the equipment, the, the ease of access of the services and your ability to do what you need to do to get a patient not only well but with a high quality of life is instantaneously available. In order to be able to do that as a system, Stony Brook has embarked on really trying to uh, deliver healthcare locally and not make it so that everything comes to the mothership. Uh, I was at Columbia for many years, Mass General uh, for many years, and during that period of time, everything was about bringing things into our institution. And as Bob really pointed out, now it's an entirely different concept that we're delivering. How do you deliver state-of-the-art care locally? Um, at Stony Brook, we have a full set of services. In cardiology, and uh, I'll probably tick off a few diseases uh, in the crowd, uh, we have a state-of-the-art advanced heart failure program I'll talk a little bit about. Our electrophysiology program is the one that takes care of your atrial fibrillation, your defibrillators, your pacemakers, anything that's going wrong with your electrical system. Our non-invasive group are the ones that are going ahead and imaging your body in ways five years ago we didn't think was possible. Non-invasively, we can go ahead and take a look at what your tissue looks like inside of your heart muscle. We can take a look at how the electrical system in your body is actually causing each heart uh, heartbeat to occur, occur. And in your blood vessels, we can see the earliest buildup of any kind of plaque uh, due to cholesterol or just a, an unfortunate family history. In interventional uh, uh, cardiology, those are the places where we're going ahead with small catheters, not through your groin anymore, but through your wrist, to go to the blood vessels of your heart. And uh, generally, within about 30 minutes of the onset of you hitting a hospital, we can have a blocked artery completely open, saving all the heart muscle that that artery was providing. Um, as far as our inpatient care, again, an entire revolution of how we look at a heart uh, patient and how we manage a heart patient. Uh, you mentioned about cataracts. When you had a heart attack uh, uh, not too long ago, that was a two to three week hospitalization and your risk of coming out of the hospital was, of uh, not coming out of the hospital, was one in five. Now, your risk of not coming out of a hospital after a heart attack, uh, the latest data from Stony Brook is 2%. And so the challenge of being able to deliver that technology uh, really is something that we take uh, at the highest level. Our cardiac CT surgery program, which I'll speak a little bit about, is also state of the art. It used to be that we were doing procedures that required uh, two, three, four week stays in the hospital after uh, bypassing an artery or fixing a valve. Not only are we bypassing, uh, we're sending people home within about four or five days, 
but the amount of damage that's, uh, and rehabilitation that's necessary for these people now has shrunk in half. And lastly, we're doing things in a very, very non-invasive ways. Not 10 years ago, if you needed a bypass, that bypass had to be done through a full incision through your breastbone. We're doing minimally invasive bypasses. It used to be if you needed a valve replaced or a valve repaired, we, it was open heart surgery. Now in the majority of cases, we can take a catheter, put it in through your groin, and have, it, uh, uh, have a valve on top of that catheter, bring that up to your heart, deploy it, and three days later you're leaving the hospital without any cuts within your entire chest. I mentioned to you the different uh, you know, parts of our, uh, of our programs and our group, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about how they uh, interact and, uh, and how they're now localized uh, in Southampton Hospital. I did want to bring up one person. That's the gentleman uh, down there on the right. Uh, that's Dr. Robert Pio, who's the new director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory, hired uh, about six to eight months ago. And he was uh, one of the top interventional cardiologists in the entire world. Uh, stationed out at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. I kiddingly tell him that uh, the head of that institution is a, is a person who's rather famous. And he's famous for doing an enormous number of procedures with very, very, very few deaths. And the reason uh, I always uh, say that he has very few deaths is any time a patient was doing poorly, he would turn and say, go get Robert. And Robert would come running in, and he was the advanced interventional guy. He was the one who was holding the catheter as all hell was breaking loose. Robert came to us uh, back in January, and I cannot begin to tell you that the change uh, in terms of salvageable people uh, has just gone through the roof. There is no interventionalist in Suffolk County that now doesn't rely on Robert in their most difficult of cases. Having said that, he's also in constant contact with people even locally at outside hospitals, looking over the angiograms and saying, wait a second, I think there's a different approach, a different way, here's what you need to do. And that has been a, a gold mine in terms of the amount of people who are being saved and treated in a way that allows that care to stay local. Um, uh, a little bit of bragging about Stony Brook. Uh, as of 2017, uh, our mortality rates for people who have any kind of cardiac issue is the best on Long Island. I know that uh, you know, some of you kind of think that there's a heart hospital somewhere way west of here and that North Shore seems to have the best commercials in the history of the world. When you actually take a look at the data, uh, we rank at the top. When you take a look um, at uh, people who have heart failure. Heart failure, the inability of the heart muscle to pump blood out in the forward direction to provide for the needs of the body. Uh, friends, family, uh, you know, walk around fatigued. The blood that's not coming out of the heart makes the backs up against the lungs and makes them feel short of breath. Heart failure is the leading cause of dying in patients who have cardiac disease. Why? Because a heart attack gives you heart failure. Your valves breaking down give you heart failure. Uh, uh, high blood pressure makes your heart muscle fail. All of heart failure is the final common pathway for most cardiac diseases. Uh, I, for the last 10 years, was director of the heart failure program uh, at Stony Brook, and we made a conscious decision that the things that we would value most are survival of our patients, and their quality of life. I can tell you that nationally, the focus was always on how long the patient was staying in the hospital and what their readmission rates were. And that's kind of how the push of economics into healthcare, insurance companies uh, into healthcare, really have kind of forced uh, hospitals to make these draconian choices. Our focus on, on survival and quality of life has resulted uh, in uh, a stream of uh, gold awards for, from the American Heart Association. The Joint Commission of Hospitals uh, ranks us at the top in terms of heart failure survival. And uh, within the last uh, uh, year, we have received a, uh, US News and World Report's highest rating for survival uh, with heart failure. 
why do I go ahead and tell you about what we're doing in coronary artery disease and what we're doing with arrhythmias and what we're doing with heart failure? Because the exact same things that we were doing at Stony Brook, we're now doing at Southampton Hospital. Every protocol, every way that we kind of visualize and interpret and look at the things that, uh, that are important in terms of the diseases that people in the community are suffering from, now will be indistinguishable if you walk onto a floor at Southampton Hospital or you walk into a floor uh, at Stony Brook. We also have specialty programs, cardio-oncology, uh, women who are receiving treatment for breast cancer are at increased risk because of some of the chemotherapy agents that they receive of their heart muscles being damaged, either interrupting care, limiting the amount of chemotherapy or the type of chemotherapy that they can get, or uh, after they've successfully battled breast cancer or other types of cancer, now having to battle a secondary issue with, uh, with their heart. Uh, we were the first program on Long Island to, to, uh, to initiate a cardio-oncology program. And that program is designed to evaluate women and men who are undergoing chemotherapy that potentially could affect their heart. Understanding how we can help prevent some of that toxicity from happening, modifying some of their risk factors, and then watching them very carefully through the process to make sure that at the first signs of any kind of heart disease, we're intervening. And hopefully within the next six months, we'll be starting a similar program out here at Southampton Hospital. Um, we have an advanced mechanical heart program at Stony Brook. Uh, we just uh, put in our 107th mechanical heart. Patients whose heart muscles have completely failed um, uh, and have no other choices. In the past, it was either a transplant or, you know, uh, just a conservative care, uh, allowing you to live out your remaining days as comfortably as possible. Uh, if you need a heart transplant right now, and I can magically snap my fingers and put you on the heart transplant uh, list, your waiting time is anywhere between three and seven years. So fighting for life in an intensive care unit or suffering, uh, not being able to breathe or move in your own house, you have to now survive anywhere between three and seven years in order to be able to read a heart, uh, receive a heart transplant. Why? There are about a quarter of a million people who need a heart. There's about 2,500 hearts available in the entire United States. So we had to come up with solutions to that, and we've created these devices that can be implanted into your heart that can go ahead and take over 80 to 90% of all of your heart function. If you are young enough to be able to get a heart transplant, it's a bridge to that transplant. And we have people surviving on mechanical hearts uh, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Uh, one of the patients uh, from, uh, from East Hampton uh, who has uh, an LVAD in place has had that LVAD in place for about five and a half years. Uh, in this general region uh, on the South Fork, we have five total patients that live in your community, work, play, and have returned to a pretty high quality of life based on that kind of technology. Um, we don't limit it just to this area. We have, and again, I apologize, this is a slide from now three years ago. I couldn't find the, the recent one. But this is the scope of all those patients we have placed mechanical hearts into all over Long Island. And uh, the idea is to return their care locally to their local doctors. Our bypass surgery program is headed by Joanna Chickway. Um, uh, if anybody, any of you know the name of Joanna Chickway, she was uh, the leading uh, cardiac surgeon at Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, or a leading uh, surgeon at Mount Sinai Hospital, who worked with somebody by the name of David Adams, who is considered the preeminent uh, cardiac surgeon. Before that, she was in London, England, uh, working with Sir Magdi Yacoub, who is considered the greatest cardiologist in the world. Her statistics and the cardiac statistics at Stony Brook have been nothing short of the miraculous. If you take a look at that little yellow box way, way on the right, you see the number one? She has had one death in 175 operations. 
These are critically ill, oftentimes, uh, patients who are, uh, who are in cardiogenic shock, and she has had one death in, in all of the bypass. We just completed our 125th consecutive valve operation without a mortality. So the kind of things that we have access to and the technology and people is pretty astro astronomical. I mentioned to you that we can also take valves and place them into hearts without the need for surgery. This is a program that was started uh, in 2012, and I'll only point out a really, really kind of uh, wonderful slide that uh, hopefully I can walk you through it. If you take a look at the first group there, it says in hospital death. About 3% of all people die in hospital when they get a device implanted. At Stony Brook, that number is 1.2%. And when you take a look at 30 days, not just the in leaving the hospital, the national average is somewhere around 3.5%, and ours is 1.8%. The cardiologists who are present at Stony Brook University Hospital are not just present at Stony Brook University Hospital. Part of our faculty, excuse me, uh, I'll actually get to that in a second, but that is, uh, this is uh, the full-time staff that's uh, currently at Stony Brook. Pivoting over to Southampton, East Hampton, Montauk, and, and, and the localized area. There, has been, there have been cardiologists in your communities, many of uh, you in the audience uh, actually can recognize a few names here, that have really provided outstanding care over the last 20 years. They're people that I've worked with extensively, that they've sent patients uh, to us at Stony Brook when, uh, when ad advanced types of care have been necessary, but also people who have just really manned the hospital and done a wonderful job of providing care in the community. Uh, a little while ago, they decided to join another healthcare network, and by doing that, it, provide, it proposed a really, really difficult choice because we have people who are in the community who have been taking care of patients locally and doing a fine job with that. But now, the location of where they're sending their patients into Peconic Bay Hospital all the way out into Nassau County to have their services done as opposed to keeping those services localized provided a challenge for us. And so we had to make a decision about how we were going to be able to deliver care locally in a way that created the high quality here, the advanced levels of care here. And so a few years ago, uh, we uh, started looking for really top rated cardiologists who not only could be at Stony Brook, but also would serve Southampton Hospital. And about six months into that process of looking for those people, we realized that we'd made a tragic mistake. That the concept of having doctors at Stony Brook who spent part of their time here really wouldn't work out. That to be invested in a community, to be invested in a hospital, you had to live there. You had to be a part of the community. You had to be somebody who was there four or five days a week, not just one, uh, one day every week. And so what we did was we, we, did, we changed our search, and these three doctors have been predominantly here at Southampton Hospital over the past year to year and a half. Uh, the first person, Davil Patel, is an amazing non-invasive uh, cardiologist. Uh, if you've had the unfortunate uh, 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 issue of cardiology, uh, a cardiac issue, and needed to come into the hospital and you've met him, what you begin to realize is he's a top trained echocardiographer, nuclear cardiologist, consultative cardiologist, who is capable of dealing from everything from uh, you know, I have a little bit of, uh, of an extra heartbeat all the way to cardiogenic shock. He is a really, really rich and, and valuable resource for you. Scott McGlynn was a person who had trained and was in the busiest practice in, at the University of Colorado in interventional cardiology. He had a desire to move into the community, and I think uh, if you have any kids or grandkids that are in the soccer, uh, soccer world, you'll see his kids uh, out on the soccer fields uh, every weekend. But more so than that, he is an amazing interventional cardiologist. And on the back of uh, Dr. McGlynn and the uh, gentleman uh, on the bottom, Dr. Travis Best, uh, tra excuse me, Travis Bench, sorry. 
I do have a friend named Travis Best, uh, Travis Bench, what they've been able to do in, is to create a cardiac catheterization laboratory here at Southampton Hospital whose outcomes and ability to do intervention is nearly indistinguishable from what we have at Stony Brook University Hospital. Um, that cardiac catheterization laboratory was started about uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, as Mr. Chowner was saying, over 300 uh, cardiac uh, procedures that have gone on. Uh, most or many of them, uh, acute heart attacks and then being able to get to open up that artery locally as opposed to having you being airlifted over to Stony Brook University Hospital and taking a ride on a helicopter. Now the ability to open up that artery within 90 minutes of, uh, of it starting to close up is akin to the best programs in the country. About six months ago, uh, we actually received uh, uh, approval for an electrophysiology laboratory here. Now for people who need pacemakers, people who need defibrillators, we can put them in locally and have you leaving that day or the next day uh, uh, after, after insertion. But we weren't happy with just going ahead and saying we'll do your pacemakers and your, and your defibrillators. We wanted this to be a state-of-the-art program for people who have atrial fibrillation, an irregular heartbeat that affects about one-third of all people who have cardiac disease, all of a sudden you're at the top part of your heart starts to beat irregularly and tells the bottom part of your heart that uh, it has to beat very, very fast. That used to be a disease that we would treat with a little bit of medication. We would put you on a blood thinner for life, and from that point on, you would have uh, your, your survival would be dependent on how hard that irregular rhythm made the rest of your heart work. That's not the state of the art. The state of the art now is being able to go in and completely removing that bad rhythm, something we call an ablation. The ability to do these simple ablations is now present here in the community. And the people who are doing this are world-class electrophysiologists who have been doing it for many, many years. I'm also happy to announce that as of a month ago, um, we were able to recruit, um, I, uh, all I can say is it was somebody that just was dropped down from heaven. The director of the busiest uh, cardiac catheterization laboratory uh, in Louisiana and one of the top 15 in the entire South, a place called the Ochsner Clinic. Um, there is a gentleman, by the, uh, a physician by the name of J.P. Riley, whose family had a vested interest in being in Southampton. Uh, his wife vacations in the area, uh, going back uh, decades, and uh, he's a Bronx boy who got lost somewhere in Louisiana. <coughs> and uh, uh, we were looking to bring somebody on board uh, as an Uber director, somebody who is capable of doing not just uh, procedures in the heart, but also procedures anywhere in the body that involves a blood vessel. And uh, as you can read, uh, based on his background, he is going to be a person who's going to be an invaluable uh, addition to our staff. And he is going to be present here at Southampton Hospital 90% of his time. Only 10% of his time will be spent with us uh, up at Stony Brook. So now I think you have, between the four of them, world-class cardiology care that is local, that, that is indistinguishable from any of the New York hospitals or any hospital in the country in terms of the quality of care that they can deliver. So when I showed you that list of cardiologists that are in the cardiac division, the ones there in purple, actually I think I've got a few more, are, uh, the ones in purple here are full-time faculty out here, and in addition to Dr. Rashba and Dr. Fan, the, the, uh, uh, the electrophysiologists, you now have five people stationed at the hospital who are capable of delivering at Southampton Hospital care equal to, uh, if not uh, sometimes better, than any hospital that you can find anywhere in the world. So with that, I'll kind of conclude by telling you that when we take a look at delivery of cardiology care here at Southampton Hospital, 
what we're trying to do is really understand that we might be an academic cardiology program. We might be at a uni in a university setting. But what that allows us to do is deliver community cardiology care in a way that community cardiologists can't even deliver it. By living here and being here, we get to do it 24-7. We are available at all times to be able to serve the needs of the community. The Center of Excellence is a very serious thing that, uh, that we're embarking upon. Uh, we have four out of the f there are there are no centers of, of excellence for cardiac care currently on Long Island. We are, go we are on pace to be the first. We have comp completed all five out of the five tiers in order to be able to consider that program and we'll be submitting the application shortly. But that's not just Stony Brook, that's Stony Brook and Stony Brook and Southampton Hospital uh, together. So having said that, um, uh, I'll close by, by saying that what we're trying to do is make sure that the people who live in the community have continuous access. People who are visiting the community will look at the program here and say, you know what, I know I come from New York City, but you know, I'd like a second opinion. Because care and excellence of care really doesn't matter about uh, whether or not you're located in New York City. It's about the physicians, it's about the technology, it's about the hospital, it's about the community. Being able to deliver preventative care to keep you out of our hospitals, being able to give you ambulatory care in the outpatient setting so that we have specialized localized care so that you don't have to enter into a big matrix of a system. But when you need us, when you need us in an emergency, when it's a life or death in, uh, uh, instance or it's a life-changing instance, we want to make sure that we're here for you. So with that, thank you very much. So quickly, do we have any questions for Dr. Skopicki before he goes back on the road? Uh, as you go through your training and, and we hear the word pediatrics, uh, you're immediately thinking, oh, they're just small adults. Nothing could be further from the truth. The pediatric cardiology patient is an entirely separate specialty and it's being kind of run through our pediatric program. I know that there are, there are efforts underway to be able to not only uh, uh, be able to give consultations uh, in a productive way, but also in those patients that need advanced types of uh, interventions that might be able to be done with a catheter that, uh, that we might be trying to bring those programs out here. Um, I'm going to be leaving the slides with, uh, with the videographer, and uh, so you can start uh, taking pictures of uh, the things that are there. We have uh, um, material uh, that's made up of all the programs uh, that are being offered, not only at Stony Brook, but at Southampton Hospital, and we'll be happy to kind of get that out into the community as soon as possible. Yes. Um, how would you envision, if you've considered this, uh, an East Hampton emergency room in relation to the uh, cardiology services performed in Stony Brook and anticipated in Southampton? Yeah, so, so I know you have, uh, we have the local experts in terms of uh, the, the emergency services. You're absolutely right that many people now are foregoing that traditional model of running to an emergency room every time something is going on. But more often than not, you'll have something and you're not sure what it is. I have a little bit of pain. I ha is this indigestion? You know, I think I felt my heart beating irregularly, but I really don't know. The ability to have local um, uh, stations outside of the hospital in East Hampton, you know, trying to extend it as far out on, uh, on the South Fork that we can, uh, is a critical mission for anybody who's running a cardiology program. But again, I'll leave that to uh, the emergency services to, to kind of uh, you know, give you any further details on it. I can tell you we have an office right now in East Hampton. Uh, Dr. McGlynn is there. And walk-ins are welcome. Any more questions? 
Thank you very much. You want to take some water? All right. Very mighty presentations to date. Dr. Ryu, you're on. Would everyone please take their seat? And there will be questions of the, at the end of the ne after the next two presentations. I will be sitting right here monitoring, and the doctors will be, and Mr. will be responding to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Re Dr. Rio? Yes. Good morning. Thank you very much for uh, having me here. Uh, in fact, uh, I was here about two years ago. Uh, what I can tell you, can you hear me? Oh, okay, I have to stand a little closer, I guess. Uh, two years ago, I said, oh, we are going to have it, uh, we will plan it, and, and something like that. Now it's at hand. Uh, I will show you what uh, we can really do it, and uh, what programs we can bring it here, and what kind of cancer cares can be done here in East Area. I just also realized that the slide uh, formatting somehow changed. The star should be in Southampton area where new <laughs> cancer center is occurring. And, uh, and I don't know how uh, this will pan out. I have some slides, uh, the real cancer cases that you can actually see it. Okay, so uh, let's see, I, I will take you uh, there. So, uh, Someone just approached me. I, I'm sorry, I, I could not remember your name, uh, where you came from. I came from Michigan about uh, less than five years ago. So as soon as I came here, within about a few months, I was uh, connected to uh, Bob Schalner, and we shared the vision. And Bob Schalner told me that, that we have this uh, plan. How can we do that? From that day on, Bob Schaller and Fred Weinbaum and myself talked a lot about this, and now we are seeing it. On the way here, actually, I saw the building uh, there that looked like the picture I'm going to show you, too. <laughs> the question and the message I'd like to give you is, what can we do in Phillips Family Cancer Center, so-called uh, Southampton Cancer Center that uh, you are seeing over there? I, I can tell you that entire scope of cancer care will be performed, period. <laughs> That's all. That includes uh, initial uh, consultation. We will have very rapid consultation. I, I can even tell you that we'll do same-day consultation. As soon as you call in, of course, uh, at your convenience too, we, talk, we, uh, we are going to hear about emergency medicine, cardiac heart failure and stuff. Cancer is not one minute issue of your life, right? So uh, your convenience also is very important. Caregiver's convenience and your time is also very important in cancer care and mutual decision making. That's what you are gonna see uh, today. So initial uh, uh, consultation by the expertise will be performed as soon as we can, even on the same day. As soon as we have all the staging work, works up done, and uh, as soon as we know the diagnosis, we can discuss about the treatment plan. That treatment plan is uh, consisting of tumor board discussions, you, we will have navigator functions, and of course, uh, good communication with your family members and yourself too. And that treatment phase also includes a lot of things. We usually say surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, but that's not all in cancer treatment. We are talking about nutrition, okay? We are talking about some good palliative cares. You may have some symptoms. I don't want you to be in pain for example. So uh, these palliative cares, uh, symptom, symptom controls. I also envision to combine some sort of complementary medicine. Uh, I'm Asian. I look like Asian, right? <laughs> <laughs> I grew up when I was very young with complementary medicine, but I have no idea about that. Do I have any faith on it? Not much. But 
But I hear a lot of medical news on this. And there has been 5,000, I don't know, 10,000 years of history in that region. So I like to somehow combine those here, if at all possible. There is uh, some Medicare uh, uh, approval uh, done. There is uh, some procedures that can be done that can be covered by insurance too. That's on the horizon too. And, and then I will bring clinical trials uh, that can be done in uh, Southampton and East area. Once all the treatment is over, we also have to follow you up. Now, in the oncology community, we are talking about survivorship program. That includes uh, frequent revisits to the hospital to check your status, how the cancer is doing, and also how you are doing from all those chemotherapies or radiation therapies. You just heard about cardio-oncology. That program was developed with me together, with Cancer Center together, about two years ago uh, by the leadership of Michelle Bloom. You saw the woman's uh, picture there. So that kind of things. So during this follow-up uh, after treatment visit, we are uh, discussing rehabilitation, any toxicity, and survivalship. In this, I'm also envisioning to have telemedic telemedicine function, especially with more eastern end area, including East Hampton, Monta, or some North Fork area too. So we already have uh, some equipment available that can come to your home by the nurses. With this, I don't know whether you know that or not, by this, when they put the stethoscope there, the doctors can hear it. And when they put an uh, otoscope there, we can see it on the computer screen. Of course, it's a little different uh, from person to person, but uh, that helps us a lot in evaluating for someone who already we know about. Right? For cancer care, it's a long-term issue. It's not just one visit. As long as we know your status, Without any particular big change, I believe that telemedicine can be done in cancer care too. Regionalization of cancer care. This regionalization is my word. I don't know if this is officially used in cancer care delivery or not. What I mean is regionalize it. Many uh, traditional medicine involves patients coming to the doctors. When I see old movies, the doctors go to patients' home, right? Now we are not doing that anymore. Of course, there's a lot of issues involved with that. What I'm saying is, especially in cancer care, we like to go to where the patients are. I don't mean your home, but to go to your area where we can provide uh, the uh, treatments. That's one of the reasons I'm uh, eager to open this Southampton Cancer Center too. Back in Michigan, we already did it about 20 years ago. Now we should really do it. It, it, it should happen today or it should have happened yesterday. So uh, uh, what I mean regionalization is not the abbreviated cancer care, full care service, a total care service for cancer, best cancer therapy close to your, own, your home at your backyard. And let, let us also uh, with that break the idea that one should uh, go to the uh, real big cancer center for your cancer care. It can be done right here, and I will show it to you what can be done. So uh, what I am going to bring to uh, Phillips Family Cancer Center in the East End area is expertise and high technology innovative treatments and translational clinical trial. I just added one slide for this, just to show the uh, glimpse of it, and customized uh, patient first service. Everyone here in Southampton, uh, Phillips family, will have this service. It's different from big cancer centers. You are just one of them. <laughs> here you are not. Okay? And community involvement is also very important. This was already talked about. And by the way, uh, we will always provide multidisciplinary care. Cancer care is not just one thing alone. Involves, uh, I already showed you, surgery and, and uh, chemo and radiation and a lot of other things. To do this, what's being done right now, what, has been, what we have been doing is research. How we can uh, bring the cancer care here? What kind of cancer care we be, can be brought here to uh, Southampton area and East area? And program development, excellence programs. What kind of cancer programs can be moved here? 
from big centers. And uh, to, with that, with that, uh, we have to also know what kind of clinical outcome we can get. It should be the same outcome at, uh, when you had uh, the cancer care in the so-called big centers. And uh, we are also uh, doing extensive recru recruiting of staffs right now, and training is all planned. And uh, obviously, the building is going up. So for all these, we need your support, too, to get this done. Right? So we are uh, preparing all this. I uh, told you about uh, clinical excellence. What, what it means is high quality and high value cancer center. Aggressive doesn't mean that it's good. Now more and more study results are shown that aggressive treatment was uh, not better than moderate treatment. So we have to find the really high value uh, cancer center. So number one, as I said, uh, we will bring new innovative uh, treatment programs. I will show you uh, some of them. And number two, tumor boards is directly connected with the Stony Brook tumor boards. In Stony Brook, there are 14 tumor boards running almost literally every day each site. Uh, this uh, new center is connected directly by line, directly. <laughs> it's not just a web. By line, uh, the tumor boards, real-time tumor boards will be occurring. And the clinical trials uh, will be also under unified system with the Stony Brook. Uh, clinical trials, we just say easily all clinical trials, protocols, and stuff. But there are a lot of regulations and uh, guidelines th that we have to follow, and clinical trial is written as a protocol that we have to follow literally word by word. Okay? So all those regulations and, and, and uh, guidances uh, will require a lot of system. And out of those, I envision that most of the phase two trials can be performed here and selected uh, phase three trials because of uh, the extensiveness uh, involved with this. And uh, some, some limited uh, phase one trials can be performed here because phase one will require pharmacodynamic dynamics study. That requires a lot of visits. <laughs> so uh, logistically, it'll be uh, difficult and a lot of uh, regulations too. And we are preparing for infrastructure for translational clinical trials from our own research too. And on a daily basis, customized uh, cancer treatment tailored to your individual need is very important. Individual need, this is very important. What do you want to achieve? Especially when the cancer, cancer is coming back and recurring and you are uh, having more extensive diseases. And uh, we will, uh, of course, have face-to-face uh, -face, uh, patient uh, uh, consultations and uh, family consultations all together. And I personally believe that uh, mutual decision-making is extremely important. Many cancer care can be done by almost anyone now. However, important decision-making is extremely important in cancer center. There are options available now. What kind of decision you are going to take may take you in a, to, to a different uh, level uh, down the road. More recently, we are talking about so-called financial toxicity. Of course, all these will be covered by the insurance, but out-of-pocket cost is skyrocketing in cancer center. When someone is having cancer in your family, your cost increases, and many people are bro become broke. It's, uh, it's uh, published now. So we will also discuss those things too. And then education uh, at the uh, professional level and education at staff level, education at commu uh, community level will be all performed over there. Especially I would uh, emphasize community education programs. These are very important, sharing uh, your nutrition, yoga programs or social work programs. These things are very important through support groups. We have space to run those uh, in the cancer. So uh, what's being done uh, more realistically? Uh, when building is going up, yeah, we know that it's occurring. But still, that's not all. The staffing is being recruited uh, extensively. I, I'm very busy actually interviewing these people these days. 
Um, we will have at least two radiation oncologists. Two are already trained. Uh, they are in uh, Stony Brook right now. And one more is to be recruited from UCSF who will have uh, prostate cancer special specialty. Okay. We are already getting there. And uh, we are envisioning to have two medical oncologists here. They are being recruited uh, nationwide. And we already interviewed uh, two. And we have uh, two more interviewing uh, within the next two weeks, too. So we will make that this decision very, very quick. And Bob is on top of it, uh, Fred is on top of it, too. And in addition, we will have, at the start, uh, nurse practitioner, at least one person. As the uh, practice grow, of course, the number will go up. And as well as medical assistants, uh, radiotherapists, uh, uh, chemopharmacist is also uh, already uh, 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 interviewed. And in, in infusion nurses, and all these people will be trained at Stony Brook directly. This uh, training will occur in November before we opening uh, the center in December. And uh, we will also have a very special uh, uh, personnel, radiation physicists. This is a very complex area, and radiation dosimetrists. They are directly supplied from Stony Brook Radiation Oncology Department. Uh, we will also have other uh, staffs, call center and the reception and so on and so forth. These people will be directly uh, trained at Southampton for local contacts. Now, uh, for the next about five slides, I will show you real cases, what you can expect. Okay, this is realistic. The common scenario of cancer treatment is like this. Usually, uh, chemo and radiation is given together on the same day, all right? So it's important to have chemo and radiation facility under the same roof. Otherwise, you will be moving around during the treatment. That's not desirable, right? So we will have those. Uh, it'll be uh, first floor radiation oncology and second floor uh, medical oncology. It's just a one floor difference. And this is one example of head and neck cancer who is being treated right now. I just uh, uh, found it for uh, good visualization. You see the cancer here. This entire, this, is, this cancer is really big in your throat, mouth area. It's, it's about here. As you see here, your airway is uh, being blocked. Airway became just like this. It has to be wide open like this. The patient started the treatment about, uh, about now about uh, four weeks ago, but into the treatment for about a week, we found that the tumor was already responding very well. The airway is opening it. I don't know whether you perceived it or not. This is the initial when he, uh, the patient started. This is this. This is the, showing the technology. The old tumor was here. Now it's opening up this much within just a week or two. And we can check those status literally on a daily basis. And we modify the treatment. That's the high technology we are talking about. I'm not going to use a word for this. It's called adoptive treatment, okay? So those things will be done routinely in, uh, in uh, Southampton. So into the uh, treatment for about three weeks, see how much the airway is open now. He can breathe uh, freely. This is all outpatient procedure. I do not want to keep you in the hospital for many, many days, okay? And this patient will continue uh, the treatment for daily about six, seven weeks, combined with chemotherapy. And during the course of the treatment, we have to also handle your symptoms. There is some difficulty associated with this. And all those will be taken care of. And after all these are done, we'll follow you up. I told you entire cancer care uh, will be uh, performed here. I will also show a very high-tech treatment uh, in a few slides now. This is uh, early lung cancer. You see uh, here uh, around about uh, two or three centimeter lung cancer. This is stage one lung cancer. When you say lung cancer, everyone is thinking about surgery, taking the lung out. That's not an easy surgery either. Now, now for early lung cancers, the outcome is the same whether you undergo surgery, removing the uh, lung, or you uh, receive uh, what we call 
radio surgery. Right? For the lung, it's called SBRT. Okay, I will explain to you what it is. So lung surgery can be done, and lung SBRT can be done. These became an option now. Okay? And some people may not be able to go through lung surgery either because of uh, lung function, especially when you uh, get uh, more older. So this treatment will take only four visits. It's a, a radiation uh, unit. Oops. Radiation unit and four means four sessions, four visits, office visits. And that will take care of uh, the, uh, the lung problem after two months. What you see here is only the scar. That's all. That does not cause any problems at all. Having said that, what radio surgery or SBRT means is this one. Let's imagine a pond where there is no wave, just like a mirror. Throw a rock in the middle of the pond, what would happen? There would be a big splash, right? And then the ripple effects are small and disappear soon, just like the water drop there. Imagine that. That occurs, that occurred in the, in the lung mass over there. And therefore, there will be no toxicity and no complications. That's the high-tech treatments that we are talking about there. And unfortunately, this patient was soon found to have a brain metastasis. This is called brain stem right here. And you see uh, brain uh, fluid is not flowing well. Its ventricle is enlarged. Now, uh, when I was a resident, when this occurs, it's a fatal. Ter what we call terminal, we don't say fatal, terminal. It's not the case now. This patient was also treated with radio surgery, just like this uh, water drop. After six weeks, look at this, brain is clean. Do you see any, any abnormality there? I'm a neuro-oncologist. Your normal brain will just look like this, okay? So this patient is still walking around in Suffolk County today, this morning. So that's the cancer treatment we are talking about, high-tech uh, cancer treatment. This is a, a very, very difficult situation. Uh, GBM is brain tumor. Particularly in this patient, the GBM brain tumor is multiple, not just the usual, usually GBM will have just one large mass, however multiple. This is a very, very challenging situation. This is really difficult. And this patient was treated in October 2017, just about less than a year now, right? And this patient was also treated with uh, radio surgery. And in addition to all the chemos written here, and look at this, clean, clean, clean. So uh, the similar, the same treatments will be done uh, here too. This is all outpatient procedure. And this is not the human brain. This is mouse brain. I added this slide last night because someone wanted to talk to me about some clinical trials and translational, which is on the pipeline. Okay. Look at this. This is mouse uh, brain tumor, which was done in my own laboratory. Mouse brain here. Oh. I don't see, uh, okay, let me go there. <laughs> when the brain tumor grows, it'll be like this, like this. And you see the tumor there, right? It's microscopic uh, showing. We tested uh, the newly emerging immunotherapy. When you give immunotherapy alone, it doesn't do much, right? Look at these two brains over there. It didn't do much. We gave radio surgery alone, not the full dose, because when you give full dose, the tumor will disappear just like uh, before, right? But this is to test radio surgery combined with immunotherapy, what would happen? And there's a lot of theory be behind it. That's what's being tested in this uh, laboratory study. 10 gray radio surgery, one treatment only, will shrink the tumor a lot, and the mouse will survive up to 36 days long, compared to 22 days. They will all die at 22 days. When you combine with radio surgery and immunotherapy together, look at this. This is normal brain. 
the tumor all disappeared. The only thing you can see is needle track here when we implanted the tumors. Right? And one mouse uh, did not have full control, which is this one, and the other mouse had all controlled. They survived 60 days. The upper part is the uh, survival curve. The green line is the survival curve of this treatment. That lo those lines exactly follow human situation. That green line is not tested for hu human yet. Okay. That will be brought to the clinical trial. This is called translational clinical trials. And this is being done in, uh, in my own hands, in my team's own hands, and it is being prepared for clinical trials, and the institution already approved it. So it can be brought, this type of uh, treatments can be brought to Southampton. It's a really experimental, but very promising. Right? So these uh, kind of uh, clinical trials can be performed here. I will show you just uh, a few uh, more examples. Uh, renal cell cancer, uh, the top, you see the yellow uh, uh, arrow uh, there. On the left side, you do not see the same kidney because it was removed, renal cell cancer. And this patient had a tumor recurring just next to the kidney. And surgeons did not want to really go in there because you don't want to touch another kidney and cause some problems. And this was treated with radiosurgery or SBRT. After two months, what you see is scar along the peritoneum. And middle one, adrenal gland tumor is also uh, hard to control. And this requires extensive surgery. That was also treated where the arrow is. And after two months, what you see is scar. That's all. And surgical cancer. This patient was a very young woman uh, who was treated just about two years ago. And those two arrows are recurrent tumors from the cervical cancer. And that's sitting just, just next to the urinary bladder. When you do any mistakes or any, uh, uh, cause any problems, it'll cause problem with your, your urinary bladder. It'll be perforated, ruptured, right? And that was treated to the focal spot that required five visits only, focal spots. After 12 months, what you see is scar, and what you see uh, below his uh, enlarged urinary bladder not leaking. Right? So this functional uh, preservation is also extremely important. Otherwise, this patient would, uh, uh, requ would have required uh, what's called pelvic exoneration, removing everything down there. Now, uh, I'd like to show one case of spine metastasis. When there is a spine metastasis or spinal cord compression, it's uh, really devastating because it can cause paralysis, spinal cord problem, right? And the top portion uh, where the uh, yellow lines is, uh, there is a spine involvement and spinal cord compression. The, in the white column in the middle, there is a black one, that's a spinal cord, okay? That's a compressed. And the uh, green color, the same, the spinal cord is squished. You can see it, right? And those can be all opened like uh, 495 highway, <laughs> all, all opened without surgery, without opening the surgery. When you do uh, real surgeries to remove all those, you will end up having this kind of extensive in instrumentation in your spine. You have to wear this uh, uh, brace for a long time. Have you had that brace? It will be hard, hard to even breathe. So. Uh, these uh, non-invasive treatment can be done, and also functional preservation is extremely important. One case here is C3 spine metastasis that was removed by surgery. Then, when you remove this, you have to fix with your head and your spine, and you have to drink your uh, uh, wine using straw. <laughs> you have to drink your morning coffee with straw. You cannot really drink it uh, or do like this, but we can do uh, radio surgery or SBRT to treat just like that uh, for this type of uh, situation too. Preserving your functions also very important. 
this will be uh, last slide of my, uh, my patient. He gave me permission to show this to public. <laughs> so that's why I'm showing this to you. When this patient came to me, my big question was two things. One, is his eye going to be functioning? What do you think? Yes? yes? No? Looks like it's half and half. Let's see. My uh, another same important question was, is his eyelid going to close? Because eye dryness will cause serious problems down the road. Okay. So we talked about all this. We talked about all this. Obviously, I consulted a plastic surgeon too, just in case he cannot close it. You cannot, you cannot believe it, right? And this patient had only six treatments, and two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks. His, I can tell you that his eye was functioning, he can see it, and his eyelid is closing too, right? So he was so happy, and he told me to uh, show this to the general public with his face. This is my vision. <laughs> This is a benign tumor. What I showed you is all malignant tumors. This is benign tumor called meningioma occurring at foramen magnum. What it means is right here. This is your head and spinal cord starts. This is very, very narrow area, okay? Less than, less than half inch area where your brain connects to the spinal cord and your tumor, benign tumor occurs and it's choking your spinal cord. When that occurs, when this choking really, really occurs and causes problems, it's, it, it may cause your breathing problems, heart problems, swallowing, let alone paralysis. Okay. So this patient uh, had two options, removing uh, the tumor by surgery, which requires a lot of instrumentations. I showed one example of C3 metastasis, right? <laughs> and the other is radio surgery for benign tumors. Luckily, this patient was neurologically intact, no problems there at all. So this, that's where good decision making is critically important. In this type of situation, as long as this tumor does not grow, the patient can stay the same because the patient is intact right now, right? So uh, the decision was made and she chose to I have radio surgery here. That's 2016. Look at this. This spinal cord. Oh, okay. Maybe I will go. This is the spinal cord here. You see, the spinal cord should be round. It's squished by the by the tumor here, and here the same. And this this was treated July 2016. The patient came back in uh, July 2017, a year later. You see how much the tumor shrank. You see how much the spinal cord became rounder, right? It's restoring its space, and she's happy. What I like to tell you here is, this is a resort area, as Bob said. <laughs> we can bring these patients as a medical product, and the patient can come here in July and summer, get treated, Next year, come back again. It'll also boost our hotel service here too, right? <laughs> <laughs> and restaurants, they can uh, spend a week here and get the imaging done and see the specialists, see me or whoever, and they can go back. In 2018, the patient can, can come back again. It's medical tourism <laughs> in, in Southampton and East End area. So uh, services. That will be done at uh, Southampton PFCC. Everything that you saw today. And any type of advanced radiation therapy, such as IMRT, IGRT, SBRT, these are all semantics. And radio surgery of benign and malignant tumors too. Any type of uh, chemo infusion, any type of hormonal therapy, almost any type of immunotherapy will be done. And of course, transfusion, hydration, and supportive cares. Services that will be provided to help uh, this center is radiosurgery of, for example, trigeminal neuralgia, 
this requires uh, some different scale and, and, and resources. So it will be done over there. Then the patient can uh, spend some time in the resort area. And brachytherapy, prostate implant and GYN uh, brachytherapies, uh, most likely will be done in uh, Stony Brook. This is because of National Regulatory Commission uh, regulations. And radioactive iodine for thyroid cancers will be done over there. It's just a one visit. And opening that here will require a lot of uh, regulatory resources. And obviously, bone marrow transplantation will require uh, many uh, uh, mobilization of many people and uh, resources, as well as CAR T cell. Those things will be done over there. All other cares will be done from the start to the end at PFCC. I can gladly show this building I saw uh, on the way today, <laughs> too. And, and this uh, uh, Phillips Family Cancer Center, uh, there will be two story, uh, 14,000 square footage total. Radiation oncology in the first floor will uh, be uh, equipped with a true beam that allows uh, to do high tech treatment. Medical oncology with the 14 chairs and private and group uh, settings, uh, second floor. And as I said, we have a teleconference room, all equipped, and uh, we will also provide and support the supportive care and the community service over there. We are going to treat the first patient in December. Thank you very much. So congratulations. Today is definitely a day of vision, of vision and leadership in our community. Now we'll hear about emergency care. Yeah. Gotta find my, where am I controlling it? Uh, good morning. That's, I will try and be brief. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Darren Wiggins. I am the Vice Chair of Emergency Medicine at uh, Southampton Hospital. Um, I have been here for uh, 20 years. Uh, the only person I think in the room who outranks me is Dr. Schoenfeld, who's been here for 30-something a lot, <laughs> more than me. Um, I've been through a lot of change at Southampton. Uh, I came here directly out of my residency training. Um, I trained in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a wonderful place to learn emergency medicine. It's a horrible place to live. Um, so I chose Southampton over Philly, um, and it's been quite the uh, trip. Uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is kind of the state of the union of the emergency department at Southampton, where we are today, um, and a little bit about where we're going and some of the pro projects we're working on going forward. Um, just a brief reminder of why we all live out here. Um, please go to the beach a lot. Um, uh, also, please only swim in their lifeguards. Um, this, this time of year especially, it gets very dicey. Um, this morning I was in the ocean swimming and it was wonderful, but uh, please be very careful. Um, currently our emergency department sees approximately 24,000 patients a year. Um, our emergency department is staffed 24-7, uh, all by board certified uh, emergency physicians. Um, that was not true when I first came out here. I was one of the very few board certified ER doctors when I first got out here 20 years ago. And I've told people several times I almost quit my first day. Um, I wasn't really sure what I had done to myself. Uh, after my first shift, I thought, um, I can't practice out there. There's no way. I need to get back to Philadelphia, which I didn't like, but I, I felt safer there. Um, 
uh, my very first shift overnight, uh, I realized at four o'clock in the morning I was the only doctor awake for about 40 miles in any direction. Um, that's a little horrifying when you're used to being in giant ivory towers like Columbia and Penn and those types of places. Um, some of our challenges out here, uh, obviously, is the large seasonal variation. Um, that's a challenge for every single business that works out here, not just the emergency department. Um, but it's a huge part of learning how to manage the emergency department out here and any department. Um, one way we've addressed that is by opening a fast track area in the summer so that people with minor injuries, um, I know people often get criticized for using the emergency department inappropriately, but if you're on vacation and you're 500 miles away from your pediatrician and your child has an earache at two in the morning, for you, that's an emergency. Um, it may not sound like one, but for you it is. Um, so we try and adapt to that. Um, we also do adult and pediatric, which is, um, for community hospitals, not all that unusual, but for large academic centers is very unusual. So you have to have recruit doctors who have the ability to do both. Um, in this day and age, many emergency physicians are trained in one or the other, not so much both. Um, so you have to have doctors who can do both. Uh, here's our emergency department as it stands today. That was a new facility about eight to 10 years ago. Um, the uh, we spoke briefly about uh, the infrastructure at Southampton. Um, the one limitation I had when we built this department wasn't funding, uh, it was space and the building. Um, it was very, very difficult to get all the things we wanted and needed given well, where we were. We're in a building, that building is the 65 or 75. Um, actually, we're half and half, we're in between two buildings. Um, that's a long time ago in, in building worlds and in medical building worlds, it's ancient. Um, the things we found when we pulled down some of those walls was very interesting. <laughs> um, today, uh, we are a level three trauma center. That was not true when I got here 20 years ago. Um, that was a huge amount of effort uh, to get that designation. Um, we're still working on it. Uh, right now, we're, we have a, uh, I can't spell either. Um, the stroke center, we have, be, uh, have a certified stroke center that is also new. Um, the cardiac catheterization lab has changed my world dramatically. Um, when I first got here, um, if you were having a bad heart attack and were unstable, it was horrifying for me um, because I had to get you not only stable, but I had to get you stable enough to get you 45 miles away. Um, that's really difficult, um, especially if you're wildly unstable. Um, and a lot of patients with heart attacks are. That's the nature of the beast. Their heart is dying and we're trying to do something to stop that. Um, today, I have to keep you alive for five minutes. That's a lot easier. <laughs> That's, let me tell you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a doctor to figure that part out. Um, we also developed a high-level decontamination area in the hospital. That happened during the Ebola crisis. Um, so now we have the ability to isolate a patient with a hot zone, a warm zone, and a cold zone. Um, and I often said this, we did this as much for our own staff as we did for the patients. Um, there's gonna be one patient with a horrible disease. Uh, there's gonna be 30 of them if my entire staff gets contaminated. Um, so we. Uh, developed this whole program that still is in place. Um, although Ebola has kind of died out, there will be another one. Um, there will be another scare. Um, so we constantly work on that as well. Um, one of the things you'll often hear me say is I don't practice in a vacuum. Um, it, it's the emergency department is wonderful. I love emergency medicine. My job is to keep you alive until these people can get to you. Um, and that's kind of how it works. We have a very large number of on-call specialists. Uh, this is only a sampling of them, of what we have available at Southampton. They're all on-call 24-7, 365. They're always a phone call away from me, and they will come in for me if I need their physical help as well. Um, it, it is a very large team. Things we have in the hospital. Um, it's also part of the theme of I don't work in isolation. Um, uh, the ER is wonderful, I love emergency medicine, but I need all these other departments behind me in order to provide care. Um, it's easy to raise money for emergency medicine. It's a very sexy thing, it's a very popular thing, um, but I also have to realize that uh, alone, I don't do a whole lot. You know, I keep you alive until I can get you to one of these other departments where I use their resources um, from radiology, ultrasound, CAT scan lab, blood bank, the cath lab is new and thankful. Um, obviously pharmacy, endoscopy, all these things, and especially the operating rooms, are a huge part for me. Uh, a quick shout out to the ambulance services. Uh, we have a huge volunteer uh, ambulance service in Suffolk County, um, perhaps the largest in the country. Um, 
these are the ones that come to Southampton often. Our ER doctors serve as the medical directors for all these ambulance services, which basically means we try and help them with their quality, their quality improvement, their protocols. Uh, one of our ER doctors is the chair of the Suffolk County Ambulance uh, Society, or regional REMAC, sorry, um, which basically sets all their policies, procedures, protocols, um, and that is one of our doctors. Um, here's a little bit of uh, what we do. Uh, this is actually the Bridgehampton EMS uh, practicing their decontamination uh, practices. Um, you have a mass casualty drill going on up there. Uh, this is EMS Appreciation Week. Um, I always try to remember at four in the morning when they come in and I'm tired and uh, I really don't want another patient right now. Um, I'm getting paid. <laughs> you know, these guys aren't. Uh, it's four in the morning and they have to go to work in the morning. Um, and what they do is absolutely amazing. So uh, we really do have to support them. Um, things we've done in the department recently to try and uh, improve our services. Um, one was we developed a pediatric trauma room. Uh, we have uh, children aren't just little adults, but, but they kind of are. Um, <laughs> but you need smaller equipment. Um, and that was what we did. Everything is color coded now in our pediatric trauma room so that I basically have to define what color that child fits into. You're a red, you're a blue, you're a green, you're a yellow. And then we pull out the equipment that is all based on those color schemes so that I don't have to think so much. Um, it's very hard to do math when you're dealing with a sick child. Um, so everything is pre-done, pre-set, pre-drawn up, and ready to go for any size child. Um, bedside ultrasonography, ultrasound's been around for a long time. Uh, has really just come into emergency medicine within the last 10, 20 years. Um, I will tell you the very first lecture I ever got in ultrasonography was given to me during my residency by a radiologist. Um, he gave one lecture to our department and he was never seen again. Um, that's the truth. He was fired the next day for telling the ER doctors about ultrasound. Um, that's not true anymore, <laughs> thankfully. Um, we now have uh, bedside ultrasound in the MR department available 24 seven. We actually have two machines that we now use. Um, it is life-saving. I'll tell a little bit of a story. I went to my training in Seattle uh, on ultrasound probably 10 years ago now. Uh, I took the class. It was a week-long class in ultrasonography. I came home the next week. Uh, I had a midnight shift. I was working. They brought in a patient at 10 o'clock at night, collapsed at the beach, unconscious. He gets intubated. We're going through our process. And I think this is a great patient to practice on because he can't watch me drop the probe. He can't tell that I have the image upside down. He's not going to see all these things, all the mistakes I'm going to make. And you make mistakes when you first learn a new piece of equipment. So literally, I'm doing it because I need practice. And I'm looking. Um, he has a large aortic dissection that I find with the ultrasound machine. I never would have known that was there. I never would have seen it. I never would have diagnosed him. Uh, he was transferred to Stony Brook. Fast forward four weeks later, I get a phone call. I didn't get a phone call. One of the nurses said, the guy on bed four wants to talk to you. He says you saved his life. I couldn't believe the guy lived, quite frankly. Um, he never would have lived prior to having bedside ultrasound. So that's a huge difference in our emergency department. Um, took a lot of training, a lot of dropping probes. <laughs> Um, our Tick Resource Center, uh, one of our ER doctors also serves in the Tick Resource Center. Um, people who don't live in this part of the world don't think ticks are an emergency. Um, I can tell you that it's a lot of tick-borne diseases, those patients get really, really sick. Um, and a lot of those patients don't have access to other health care either. So they do end up in the emergency department. Um, and education is important. You know, prevention is, is worth a pound of, of treatment. Uh, we now have fiber optic intubation in the emergency department. That was not true when I first got here. So basically, um, I can use a fiber optic scope to go down and put the tube down into your throat instead of just trying to look and kind of hope I'll get it in. Um, it has made a huge difference, especially in trauma patients. I can't move your neck. I'm not allowed to move your neck as much. So now I can use something that's very flexible and go into your airway without manipulating your neck in case you have a broken neck. I'm not going to damage your spinal cord. Uh, we now do a ton of screening in the emergency department. Um, we do HIV screening, so basically every single patient that comes to the department is asked if they want HIV screening. Um, we do it in the department, it's rapid, we have it back within an hour. Um, this is kind of on the, the logic of this is that there's a large population out there that doesn't know they're HIV positive. Um, and it's the patient who doesn't know they're positive who continues to spread HIV. A patient who's HIV positive, who's being treated, who becomes undetectable, really almost cannot transmit HIV. Um, 
So that's part of this. So it doesn't sound like emergency medicine. Um, we have a large at-risk population that comes to the ER, um, and that's part of our job. Expert screening is for abuse, uh, drugs of abuse. Um, obviously a very big topic, and we'll talk a little bit more about it coming up. Um, it's become a very, uh, obviously we're in the middle of a giant uh, opioid epidemic in America um, that is slowly coming under control, um, but we have screening now that every single patient that comes in is screened and asked questions about the potential for abuse, and to try and screen them, do a brief intervention, and then refer them for treatment. Um, we talked about uh, infectious disease isolation already. We do sepsis screening, that's a new thing. Uh, patients, every single patient that comes to the emergency department is screened for sepsis. Um, sepsis has been shown that if you can treat it within the first hour, you will decrease mortality. That's hard to do. Um, it's very hard to do all the things you need to do that quickly. And if you don't identify it as soon as they walk in the door, you're never gonna be able to do it. Um, every hour that passes, their mortality goes up. Um, so we have screening, basically every single patient has a form filled out by the nurse who goes down a checklist of trying to identify who's at risk for sepsis and then flags it. We have a whole system in place for flagging and treating them. And we also have protocols in place for what to do once we identify sepsis. Uh, nitrous oxide is what's old is new again. Um, when I trained in emergency medicine uh, a while ago, um, this was already ancient technology. Um, it had basically gone out of favor in the emergency department and wasn't that used. I wasn't trained in nitrous oxide when I did my training. Um, as the opioid epidemic has raged, we are trying to find ways to treat patients without using narcotics um, and use less narcotics. And so nitrous oxide has become popular again. Um, this was uh, one advantage of being in a small community hospital is I went to the dentists. Those are the guys who use nitrous. Um, and I asked for their help. And I said, look, I gotta train eight ER doctors on how to do something that none of us know how to do. And you do it all day, every day. Um, and two dentists stepped right up and said, no problem, we'll show you how to do it, we'll show you how to play with the dials, we'll show you what, we'll tell you what works, we'll tell you what doesn't work. Um, that's a huge benefit of being in a small hospital. I knew them, they knew me, um, it was easy. Uh, minimizing radiation in pediatrics, this was a project we did with the radiology department um, of trying to minimize uh, the exposure in children. Um, it's very easy to order CAT scans. It's very easy to order multiple CAT scans. It's very easy to order very complex CAT scans. All those things add up for more and more and more radiation, um, especially in children. Uh, it becomes a real issue. So we've developed uh, strategies for minimizing. Um, one of the big things we've done is with the ultrasound machine again. We're now looking at appendixes with ultrasounds instead of CAT scans. Um, that's a huge change for children. You can't always do it, but if it's there, it's great. Uh, you can save the child from coming to get a CAT scan. Hospital flow, um, one of my pet peeves, um, is uh, getting patients out of the department. I only have so many beds, um, and when those beds fill up, I can't see any more patients. Um, that's a problem. Um, so what, and it's really, we always say the ER is the canary in the coal mine. Um, we are kind of the signal of the health of the whole hospital. Um, so it's not just the emergency department, it's the entire hospital, and the administration has been amazingly supportive in this. Um, most ERs bang their head up against a wall on this one. Uh, they fight, they fight, they fight, they don't get any support, and they give up. Um, we actually managed to, to decrease our door to floor time by an hour, you know, just by marshalling resources, notifying the hospital when we're in trouble. We have criteria that are constantly monitored by flow managers whose job it is to make sure patients move out of our department in a timely fashion. And when there's a problem, identify the problem, what resources do we need, where do we need them. We kind of use the FedEx model of, of swarming, trying to find out where the problem is. That's been a huge change. Uh, stroke designation, trauma designation, those are kind of boring, but a lot of work uh, to get those things. Um, we now have code H's, code gray's, code T's. We didn't have any of these when I first started here. Uh, the code gray is for stroke. Um, it marshals an entire team that descends on the department to help us with that stroke patient to get them into CAT scan quickly so that we can give thrombolytics quickly. Uh, the whole concept of time is brain. Uh, the code H is the heart attacks, which are going to the cath lab in a rapid fashion. Uh, like I said, it, I used to have to stabilize you for hours and hours and hours, and, and now I have to keep you alive for five minutes until I can get the doors open to push you over to the operating room. Um, code T is trauma, which brings the surgeons and the surgery residents um, and opens up the ORs uh, that we need. Just some visuals of what we're talking about. Uh, this is a uh, Braslow cart on your, sorry, your left. 
Um, as you can see, it's color coded. Uh, our entire room is color coded now to match that. Uh, here we are doing uh, some decontamination uh, training with the ambulance services. Um, these are things you have to practice. Um, the first time you try and put all this gear on, it's not real easy. Um, as you can see, that's a pretty complex outfit to put on and get off, and you can't touch it is the other problem. You know, you can't touch anything. Once this guy gets exposed, everything on him is contaminated, and somehow you have to get this on him and get it off him without touching it, because if you touch it, you're going to die. So it gets a little rough. Um, you have to practice, and we do. We do drills constantly with EMS. Um, there's a nitrous oxide machine over there uh, that was bought last year. Uh, we've already started using it. One of the doctors called me last night and just said, I, I love it. Thank you so much for getting that. It was so much easier. Um, it's very popular in pediatrics, especially kids. There's an age group, you know, under five, I can probably pin you down. <laughs> uh, over 15, I can probably reason with you. There's that little in-between spot that's really hard. Um, and this is perfect. Uh, the, the child's very sedate, calm, cooperative, and it's a lot less a traumatic experience for the kid. Things we're working on going forward, um, oral rehydration. This is a project that I started um, not too long ago. Uh, the concept is that it's always better to use the mouth than it is to use an IV, um, if you can. Uh, we've gotten in the habit of using IVs because they're easy. Um, for most of the world, they don't have IVs, um, so they use oral. Guess who has the better survival rate? They do. Um, IVs don't always work great. Um, there's a great study out of Africa um, that showed that the children did horribly when they flooded them with IV fluids, and they did great when they gave them oral rehydration. Um, so we've worked on that. The, the impetus behind this actually was uh, the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico. It knocked out the IV fluids across the country. Uh, there were ERs that were having to ration their IV fluids. It was becoming quite a crisis. It's a little bit easier now, but there was certainly a potential that I wasn't going to have IV fluids, um, and we needed to have strategies in place for how to deal with that. Uh, the next two are in response to the opioid epidemic, uh, also trying to find alternative ways for controlling pain uh, that don't involve opiates. Um, emergency departments have been singled out as the source of the first taste of opiates for a lot of patients. Um, I'm, I fight back and say we're not really responsible for the huge opioid epidemic. Please don't blame us. Um, we're doing the best we can. If you have a broken femur, you want pain medicines. I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> you're, there's no, no easy way around that one. Um, but there are other things we can do. And instead of escalating opiates, um, which is what we do traditionally, there are other modalities to use and other drugs we can use that are much less addictive. Um, but you have to have protocols in place. Uh, some of these are old. Intravenous lidocaine is an ancient, ancient therapy um, that we're basically re reinventing now, just like we did with nitrous. Um, ketamine is a very new concept. Ketamine is an anesthetic, um, but it can be used in very low doses and is amazing for pain control. Um, right now, we're also in the process of training our PAs to use our ultrasound machines. Uh, we learned very quickly that as the doctors developed the skills, that was great. Uh, we have PAs that work alongside us who didn't have the skills. Um, the problem is I now became an ultrasound tech for my PA. <laughs> so we had a little bottleneck there that we're trying to work out um, and get them the skills to do these on their own. Um, it's amazing. Ultrasound, you know, I always talk about the heart. Um, we used to listen to the heart very intently, and, and listening to heart skills is an incredible skill. Um, but now I can look. I don't have to guess. I don't have to listen for little subtle rubs and subtle noises. I can look at your valves and see what they're doing. I can look at your heart and see how hard it's squeezing. Um, I don't have to rely on my ears to tell me what your heart is doing. Um, I can actually look at your heart in two seconds and tell what it's doing. Um, that's uh, now moving into lung exams also. Um, they've shown that ultrasound of the lungs is actually better than an x-ray of the lungs, which is a thousand times better than my stethoscope. Um, so stethoscopes are kind of becoming a thing of the past as you see more and more ultrasounds being used. The new Southampton facility is going to be a huge project, obviously. Uh, the emergency department will be on the first floor. That much I can tell you, that's about all I know, <laughs> is that I'll be on the first floor somewhere. Um, and similarly with the East Hampton facility, uh, is going to be a very large project. Um, what that entails, I don't think anybody in this room knows yet. Um, we're work working on that day by day. Um, some of the things I want to bring to you guys is, is the challenges that are ahead for that concept. Um, they're not huge, they're not insurmountable, but they are there. Um, one is volume. Uh, how many patients 
are there. Uh, one of the things I always tell Mr. Schaliner is I can do anything with volume. If you give me a lot of patience, I can do it. I can do it, I can fund it, I can make it happen, I can teach the staff how to deal with it, whatever. Give me three of them? Uh, that's kind of hard. It's hard to build the program around three patients. Um, so you need volume. Um, the staffing, all these kind of interrelate on each other, and this is nothing you haven't heard before, um, but drawing doctors out here is not easy. Uh, I can tell you that we've had an opening in our ER group for over two years, a partnership track very attractive, in theory, position. Um, it's been two years. The last person turned me down in under six hours, uh, the last job offer, and it was a very generous job offer. Um, there's just nowhere to live out here, and that's very difficult. Um, I, I, people have heard me say it before, but as soon as I hear the other person on the phone say, well, I'm thinking about going to Texas, I just hang up the phone. Uh, the Texas job market is a 1,000 times better than mine. Um, Housing is, is one of the big things. It's not the money. Um, I can offer them all the money in the world. If they can't buy a house, you know, where am I going to live, Dr. Wiggins? Um, right now, I am the easternmost ER doctor in, in Long Island, <laughs> and I live in Watermill. So that's <laughs> to you guys, that's not real east. Um, that's uh, the, the reality. Um, and what uh, location and infrastructure, exactly what that's going to look like, how big, how many beds, how many rooms, and that kind of ties into what services are going to be offered, uh, how advanced do you make this facility, um, what is actually needed um, at that site, how do you coordinate with the main hospital. Um, obviously, the main ER still has to exist as well, um, and they need to complement each other and work together. Um, funding is huge. Um, uh, building the facility is one thing, keeping it running is another. Um, you need about 18,000 patients a year to have a break-even ER. That's, again, volume is everything. Um, if the main ER is only seeing 24, you're not going to get 18. Um, that's just not going to happen. Um, so how do you model it so that it does work? Um, these are things we're all working on. And last, I put in there competition. Um, as a businessman, the minute I hear there's a new ER opening, the first thing I do is look for a place to open an urgent care center across the street because I know there's a market. Um, somebody else did the homework. It's like Wendy's opening across from McDonald's. You know, it's like, let somebody else do the homework for me. Oh, there's a need? I see it. Um, you're going to have competition out here. You already see the urgent care centers opening. Um, emergency medicine across Long Island is down 10% in volume. Um, it also is a problem for training. Um, the vast majority of young ER doctors are now going into urgent care. Uh, they're not going into emergency medicine. It's a better lifestyle. Um, it's a little bit of an e it's a lot of an easier job. You know, I always make the joke, oh, you're sick? Call 911. You know, that's what, that's <laughs> an urgent care center, what you can do. I can't do that. <laughs> oh, you're sick? It's me. Um, so it's a very tough market right now um, for emergency medicine. Um, I know we're working on the facility, trying to figure out what's going to work for East Hampton. Um, it will be a unique solution, I guarantee you that. Um, there are only, I believe, five freestanding ERs in all of New York State right now. Um, there's hundreds of them in Texas, there's hundreds of them in Colorado, uh, very different business models, uh, very for-profit driven by giant corporations. You can't do that in New York State. Um, so it will be a very unique solution, whatever we come up with. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was so interesting. I mean, everything has been interesting, and I want to thank, before we begin any discussion, I want to thank Sheila Rogers, and I want to thank Dr. Weinbaum for putting together what I think is an extraordinary opportunity, not only to examine what we have today, not only an opportunity to hear our medical resources address us, but also to see where we're going. And that's really what will be the future here in East Hampton of our healthcare system. So thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Dr. Weinbaum. And let's hear it for the doctors. OK, now, since we're running a little late because we've had such a full and what I like to refer to as a mighty program, um, I think we'll just stay in place, and I'll walk around with my microphone to anybody who has any questions to ask any of our doctors, if that will work with you. 
Okay, so I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity for everyone to ask their questions, but also to get some short questions. Yes, uh, this is for uh, you. This is for you. Yeah, I don't think it's on. I can speak loudly. Okay, Let me good. stand up. Yeah, uh, come this up is, here. This is a question for you, doctor, as an emergency room principal um, in East Hampton as your problem as you said, you need 18,000 patients in order to make it work. So that leads to the idea of, okay, so what area of medicine would cause you to have an emergency room that could be supported? And maybe what kind of additional services might come into that emergency room to assist? Now, the facts are that we've got a population of seniors that's 24%. And you're possibly familiar with Conic Landing on the North Fork. We have no senior housing to speak of in East Hampton. A large population of people come out here in the summer from New York. These are wealthy people. They would more than likely stay here year round. Thought that there were facilities like that that could assist them in their old age. So the solution to your problem, I'd like to know, is it is it in the senior population here? Have you considered it? I think you have to realize this is an aging population out here, and any emergency department is going to have to cater to the aging population. Um, to survive, and it has to be part of your business plan of, you know, you, you, you can't anchor on pediatrics out here. That's, you can ask the pediatricians in the room. That's, that's a, you think emergency medicine's difficult, that's even harder. So yeah, I do believe it's gonna be a huge part of, of, of it because, uh, you know, strokes and heart attacks are what people think about when they think about emergencies. And 20 year olds don't have strokes and heart attacks. You know, it, it is the elder population that has those issues. Um, yes, there's trauma, yes, there's other stuff, but out here, you can't go fast enough on the roads to hit somebody. Um, you know, the, the truth is, there's, it's hard to get up to speed unless you're on the stretch um, to do real damage. Um, so it's, that's, I would say 90% of my real trauma comes from napping stretch, because um, that's where you can go fast enough. But anyways, yes, so it's about it. Any other questions? Here I'm, I'm walking around with two microphones. Can you give us a rule of thumb as to whether we should go to an urgent care center or an emer an, your emergency? You should center. always go to an ER, but that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm very biased. Um, you know, you, uh, I think what you try and think of is, is, do I think I have something that's life-threatening? Is there a chance? Not do I think, but is there a chance? Uh, you know, in my head, chest pain should always go to an ER because you're wasting time going in the wrong direction. Um, that's, I always worry about people who are in Wayne Scott and then drive out to Amagansett with chest pain because you're driving away from the cath lab, um, which is what you may actually need. Um, it's a very hard decision to make sometimes. And again, it's a very different answer for the 20-year-old versus the 80-year-old. Um, those are two very different populations. Um, but I think you have to think in terms of, do I think I have something that's life-threatening? That's always going to end up in emergency medicine. Let, let us at least get the first crack at it. Um, you know, uh, I also tend to say that if you, if you know it's broken, it's probably easiest to go to the ER. Um, if you think you're not sure it's a sprain, I can walk on it, but I don't really know, yeah, that could probably fall into urgent care. Um, so it's a little dicey, and it's a, the spectrum, you know. Okay, do we have any questions for Bob Chalner, for Dr. Ryu? We have a great lack of uh, internists and primary care doctors out here. That's why we're forced to the urgent care. And now it sounds like the emergency center is going to become the primary care because if we're sick, we have to go somewhere. C can there not be some combination of that within the emergency care for things that are not truly emergency, but to have some internists or, I mean, this is the ideal. We just, I cannot find a new primary care. I lost mine of several decades. I can't find one out here. I think the answer to that is not necessarily in the emergency room, but it's to, um, uh, we need to recruit more primary cares into the community, and that's the that's the major goal, right? No, I I totally agree. But our we, right, yeah, it's not. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, which is not it's what we want to do. Sword. We really don't want to push people into the emergency room. We want people to get the primary care because an ER doc, Dr. Wiggins, 
he'll see you once, but he's really not interested in managing your <laughs> diabetes on an ongoing basis. Anything right. done about increasing primary? Yeah, absolutely. We've done a number of things already. We've created a, we're working, number one, to try and support the primaries that are already in our community and make sure that they stay here. And that's, a, that's number one, hold on to what you've got. Two is, as I talked about the training programs we've got in family medicine and internal medicine to try and train them and keep them in the community. We've also, a number of the doctors, we created this company called Meeting House Lane Medical. Dr. Weinbaum is the president of that. That was specifically because what was happening here was doctors were retiring or they just couldn't make it on their own. It's very, very difficult. The days where a doctor came into community, hung a shingle on an office and, and, and set up practice are gone, especially out here where the costs are so prohibitive. So we've been absorbing those practices uh, when a doctor feels like they just can't do it anymore to keep them here and also opening up new sites. And we've got sites now doing that in Sag Harbor, Amagansett, Wayne Scott, out in um, uh, Montauk and on into Southampton and out to West Hampton. We need more doctors. We need to get more primaries into those practices, and we are. We just added, I think, uh, three this year that we're putting into practices. Um, so it's a constant effort to keep recruiting. We've got locations. We need to expand the number of doctors. I don't think we can do it by expanding emergency services. It's, it's both. You need emergency for emergency, and we've got to build the ambulatory capacity for that. And I hear that all day long from people, I can't find a doctor, I just can't get in quickly enough, so we know there's a shortage and we know we have to get more into it. So we're also working on, we're in the early stages of building a referral center too, so with one call we can place you and find a doctor that's appropriate for the specialties that you need and also a um, taking your insurance, which is the other issue, every doctor takes different insurances. So. One more question? Well, I wanted to thank you for an excellent presentation, um, very informative and very reassuring, frankly, uh, I think, to the population, knowing what you're doing now and what you're going to do in the future. Um, so much of this goes back to the lack of affordable or workforce housing, how you attract uh, doctors, how you attract staff. It seems to me that um, the community, through their elected officials, have been ne totally negligent um, in, in, in making any kind of progress in this area. So how will we be um, assured or, or ha how can you come out of this being optimistic um, when there's no commitment to moving, making any progress in this area? Because too much of this is depending on this. Um, well, I completely agree that housing is probably our biggest challenge. You heard Dr. Wiggins talk about it, Dr. Ryu as he's recruiting people. I mean, and even specialists, some of the highly paid specialists just don't want to live here because they can, they can get the same house for a third or quarter of the price in another part of the uh, country. And it's, it's, it's a real, real challenge. And we lose people all the time because of it. And as I said, Forget about the doctors. Try attracting a nurse's aide and, and, and get them to work out in Montauk. Um, I'm not an elected official, so I don't have any control over land use or housing or you know all of the, the rules and issues around it. I, th I do live here, though, and I absolutely believe we need to come together as a community and make housing available for the people that are working here. And it's not just the hospital, it's all the other services, um, because it is turning into a real, real crisis for us. And, and, and the elected officials, if they're not willing to do it, my personal opinions, elect people that will do exactly. it for us. Go to your Go to your town board, go to your village boards and continue to talk about this issue of affordable housing, not only just for our healthcare services, but for those services that make this community what we all want it to be. But unless we, number one, speak out in front of those who are elected, make sure that we have candidates who reflect what we need, and number three, vote, vote and make sure that everyone that you know in this community that has an investment in this community, no matter whether it's a financial, historical, legacy, this is our community and we all have to vote. And with that, 
I'm going to get off my soapbox <laughs> and thank not only the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation, Sheila, Dr. Weinbaum, our speakers. I think we've had an extraordinary opportunity here. And again, it's just a demonstration of what we can do and what we can expect in the future. Thank you.